Happy to have all of you here. Um, thank you for joining us today on our August 4th school board meeting. Um, I call this meeting to order. Please, uh, we thank you for your patience as we are in a, a closed meeting. So thank you for allowing us the, the grace to get up here and get started. If you will now um, please join us in a moment of silence as I catch my breath. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now if um, you would like to join us, please, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to now call for approval of our proposed agenda. Uh, I move we approve the agenda. A uh, second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. Um, we are now going to move on to the first opportunity for um, comments from the community. We offer two opportunities. Um, the first being right now, we do have some people in the media center, and then we will check in after that to see if there's anybody signed up um, online. So we do have a list of people, and I do believe the first one on our list is Ms. Catherine Tillich. So please come up to the podium. Um, if you'll state your full name, your address, and um, you're limited, or we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Catherine Tillack. I will email my address to the board. Um, I go by Kate. Uh, has my time started? Okay. Um, I support the treatment of transgender non-binary students document, and I'm going to read a list written by my 10-year-old child. I support this public school system and say thank you to the instructors and counselors who have supported my child. To all LGBTQ plus people, I say, I see you, you belong, and I love who you are. At home, my child and I are working through this book called Do the Work, an Anti-Racist Activity Book. If you are white and you have not started your anti-racist work, then you are upholding white supremacy. It is an either or. This book includes LGBTQ people of color, such as Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Polly Murray, Audre Lord, Bayard Rustin, Alicia Garza. It's important to make the connection that white supremacy is the reason LGBTQ rights are destroyed. As a white person, I have white privilege, which is why my anti-racism work is essential. But as a queer person, the ideology of white supremacy wants me gone. It does not want me to exist or any LGBTQ person of any age, which includes our trans, non-binary, and other LGBTQ students. This is why we have the Don't Say Gay law in Florida and why 162 anti-LGBTQ bills, bills have been introduced this year across the United States. Our document called The Treatment of Transgender and Non-Binary Students is Charlottesville's version of that larger conversation about who gets to exist. And words must be put into action. My non-binary non child has written a list um, that I'm going to read. It's called Three Things I Want to See. And Z has also coined a term, Pride Plus, which is a stand-in term for an umbrella term for LGBTQ, because that's just a lot of letters for everyone to say. Um, this is called Three Things I Want to See. One, teachers to make it clear what pride plus bullying is and how to avoid it. Sorry, my voice is shaking a little bit. I'm gonna start it again. Teachers to make it clear what pride plus bullying is and how to avoid it. Two, for everyone to use correct pronouns and respect them. 
Three, teachers to be trained to see and stop where when pride plus kids are being hurt or bullied and to not just make them say sorry, but also to tell them why it is not okay. And I believe the them refers to any person participating in teasing or bullying. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, next up we have Ms. Esposito. Good afternoon, Dr. Gurley and school board members. I am Christina Esposito. I am a GRT at Johnson and I live in the city. I'd like to thank the school board for the ongoing discussion regarding collective bargaining for our Charlottesville City School employees. While we had hoped to have an answer by now, I believe it is far more important to get this right than to be wrong and on time. Um, I've come to once again express my strong support for broad collective bargaining rights for all of our employees. 72% of our staff and an even larger percentage of teachers signal their support for the same. I suspect that it can feel like we don't really need collective bargaining because the school board and Dr. Gurley's administration are more, more than open to discussion. Dr. Gurley isn't just talking the talk, he's walking the walk when it comes to creating a culture of care. While I can look at this school year and know we will once again face the challenge of teaching during a pandemic, as well as a shortage of staff, most notably in the transportation department, I'm confident that we will be supported by this board and administrative team. That has not always been the case. And though we might want to, we cannot assume that will always be the case moving forward. Though I've previously mentioned these issues when speaking before you, they bear repeating. There was a time when the message from central office was that we were lucky to have a job and that we shouldn't complain or ask questions. There was a time I was absolutely stopped from speaking to a school board member by my principal. Countless decisions have been made about what is best for our classrooms and for our students without ever involving us in the discussion. We are, in fact, better together. A current issue of concern is the proposed changes to the COVID leave policy. According to the documents posted online, it looks as if the policy is being changed to include five days of COVID leave per contract year. That is not enough. It is barely enough for someone who is single. For parents and caregivers, five days won't cover a single COVID outbreak within a household. This will disproportionately affect our families with young children as they are more likely to have used up many of their sick days for maternity leave. Um, I have a few questions about this change in policy. How much COVID leave was used last year? Were there instances where the division felt it was being abused? Why, what would the projected cost be to continue a policy that guaranteed our staff that guaranteed our staff never have never felt as if they had to come in when they were sick because they had run out of sick time? I know that unlimited COVID leave coupled with teachers not wearing masks is a conversation worth having. I'm sure this is something that we that can be worked out, but had collective bargaining been in place, we would have been part of this conversation from the beginning. I do not doubt this board or this administration's commitment to our students, our community, or our staff. I believe that you truly want to create a culture of care in Charlottesville City. A culture of care means knowing that we all want what is best for our students, and by guaranteeing us an equal seat at the table, you trust us enough to make that a reality, no matter who is in charge. Thank you. And next we have uh, Ms. Shannon Gilligan. My name is Shannon Gilligan. I'm a kindergarten teacher at Jackson Via and a CCS parent. Good afternoon, school board members and Dr. Gurley. The beginning of school is coming soon. And as a parent of three CCS students and an educator, I would like to urge you to continue mitigation efforts in our schools. Masking, weekly testing, COVID leave, and the test to stay program were essential to keeping our schools open and adequately staffed last year. Local cases are currently five and a half times higher than they were last year. And the CDC considers us in a high level of transmission. Mitigation should match transmission levels. And right now we need you to keep us and our children safe. I know some of the measures aren't popular, but it's not your job to do what is popular, but to use your power for the good of the most vulnerable among us. Tonight, I'd also like to express gratitude for the time each of you have given to meet with me and others about collective bargaining. Our conversations on the phone in coffee shops and over Zoom have been honest and beneficial. Thank you for coming to these conversations with trust and especially for your willingness to ask hard questions and to admit when we don't have all the answers yet. We are moving into new territory by pursuing collective bargaining and you are being courageous. 
by sifting through all the information and deciding what is best for our educators and ultimately our students. There is a path forward for collective bargaining, and I believe we can make a compromise that makes us better together. You all are setting a bar for future school board members and superintendents, and I just ask you to keep leaning into this work and meeting us with trust. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Taylor. Hello, my name is Jessica Taylor. I'm a reading specialist at Clark and president of the CEA, and my pronouns are she, her. Good afternoon, Dr. Gurley and members of the board. On April 14th, the CEA presented a resolution for collective bargaining to this board. Backed by 72% of all CCS employees, this resolution asked the board to codify our rights as public sector workers to have a seat at the table when making decisions about matters that directly impact our work. As of today, the board has not voted in favor of the resolution. I have to be honest, when we first started this process in April, I thought we'd have a re resolution before the end of the school year. We have a superintendent who has said that he supports educators and wants to promote a culture of care. The board has collectively and individually, publicly and privately said that they support educators and collective bargaining. So what is stopping us from moving forward? It wasn't until I stepped back and took stock of what we have done in the 120 days since the resolution was presented that I was able to see that we have been moving forward. Members of the board, CEA and Dr. Gurley met many times over the summer to process together what collective bargaining could look like in Charlottesville. Members of the board have individually had conversations with CEA members over the summer to talk about bargaining. And I know that you have met as a board and talked amongst yourselves about bargaining. So my statement to you tonight is to thank you and to give a public testament to the work you have done so far. Very few school boards across the state have been willing to engage with employees to the level we have in Charlottesville and even fewer superintendents that encourage communication and collaboration to the degree that Dr. Gurley does. There has never been a doubt that every member of the board and Dr. Gurley want what is best for the families and employees of CCS. All of this is progress. And honestly, it's what collective bargaining is. It's working together towards a common goal. And it's talking about hard things and it's making difficult decisions. And it's being vulnerable and saying, I don't know. And it's uncomfortable sometimes, but it's a partnership between you and us that makes everyone stronger. So as we embark on another school year in a pandemic, please continue to ask us what we think. Please rely on us for input and continue to partner with us in conversations about collective bargaining. A resolution that meets the needs of both the division and the employees cannot be far away because I know everyone in this room agrees that we are all better together. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Horn. Good evening. I am Jen Horn. I teach English and public speaking at CHS. I'm a Charlottesville City Schools parent, and I am really glad to be here this evening. Um, uh, I'm not going to take up my three minutes. I am someone who fiercely believes in uh, speaking up when I feel disquiet, <laughs> but I also fiercely believe in expressing gratitude, and I am grateful. I sent out an email to all the board members and I heard back in eloquent and interested in detailed ways. Uh, Dr. Gurley has been nothing but, uh, has done nothing but reach out to teachers in very important ways and it has given me hope. So I thank you so much for all that you have done and I look forward to when we can codify this and make it so that teachers' voices are truly valued and their input is absolutely essential. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that's on, on our list, but I do see that we have um, someone else approaching the podium and, and you're welcome to do so. So please, again, just state your name and we'll have you write your address and then you'll be limited to your three minutes. 
Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nomi Dave. I'm a parent of two children um, in the uh, Charlottesville City Schools, Jackson by and Buford, so shout out to those. And I'm also a member of the Charlottesville Coalition for Gun Violence Prevention. And on behalf of our group, I want to extend a, a sincere and very warm thank you to Ms. Torres, to Dr. Gurley, and to the whole school board for everything that you've done to combat violence, uh, gun, the threat of gun violence uh, in our schools and our community, and to work with us um, uh, to support the work that we're doing and to work with us um, on a number of initiatives. So we're very pleased to say that we're going to be participating in the Back to School Bash. Um, we are going to, um, with the, um, the um, support of Dr. Gurley, we're going to be organizing a number of forums um, aimed at promoting awareness about responsible gun storage um, and involving panels of pediatricians and policymakers um, for parents and for school communities. Um, and we also look forward to Dr. Gurley continuing to communicate the importance of responsible gun storage as an essential means to prevent gun violence, the scourge of gun violence um, in our schools and our communities. As we all know, um, from the statistics that circulate, the vast majority of, um, the, of mass shootings at school uh, occur because the assailant has brought a weapon from their home. So we understand the importance of responsible gun storage and we greatly, greatly thank uh, the school board for its uh, support of our work. So thank you very much on behalf of myself as a parent and on behalf of the group. I'm really, really grateful to you for all of your support. Thank you. Thank you. And if there's anybody else in the media center who would like to make comment, you're invited to do so now. And, and then we also have another opportunity towards the end of the meeting. And I will now, I don't see that there's anybody signed up in the, or online in the Zoom. So we will, at this point, we'll close public comment and we will keep moving. So thank you, everybody. I will now entertain a motion for adoption of the consent agenda, please. Can I just ask a question about the school board assignments, committee assignments? I was just looking at it. The, it seems like the VSBA delegates are you and me. And I don't think that's true. So I just, before we go approving that, maybe we change that to reflect the reality. Because I don't think I'm a VSBA delegate and I don't, maybe I you're not. I think you were alternate last year. If you would like to. Are you the VSBA? Mm -hmm. I thought Mr. Bryant was. So I'm the delegate. You're the regional chair. Okay. Okay. Never mind. I withdraw my concern there. I and, I, and, that I we... leaned, and I leaned into you a couple of years ago. I think you, <laughs> you stepped in. Okay. So, so are it, you okay yeah. with that? Sure. Um, just I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Any questions, concerns? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I know, I just. All right, I apologize because I got so excited that we were back here meeting that I did um, miss the actual roll call of board members. Um, I think it's apparent that we're all here, but if we need to do this formally, <laughs> Madam Clerk, would you mind calling roll? And I apologize. Yes, Madam Chair. Mr. Bryant? Present. Ms. Bryson Warsberger? Here. Ms. Dooley? Here. Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. McKeever? Here. Mr. Moores? Present. And Ms. Torres? Yes, I am here. Thank you so much. All right. So now we are um, we have moved down to 8.0 action items. Dr. Gurley, did you want to? I move that we approve. Oh, the... I thought we did that. I am like. I'll move. All everything. in favor. I think we had a second. <laughs> Dr. Kraft seconded it, and and I asked, and this is related to the pol the consent agenda. Correct. Okay. Yes. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Sorry. Any opposed? All right, now we're moving forward. All right, Dr. Gurley, action items. 
So we will um, now have uh, Ms. Swift come up. Um, this is our second reading of the um, updated policies. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, and Dr. Gurley. Um, during the June school board meeting, staff presented various policies for your review. And so at this time, we would like for the board to take action on these policies. I move the approval of the policies as outlined in the June meeting. I move the approval of the policies as outlined in the June meeting. I'll second that. Hey, any questions or comments? Go ahead, Dr. Kraft. Just a quick clarification. Um, the policy on um, electronic attendance at board meetings and was um, tweaked, was was that just a, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't find it today to look at. Dr. Kraft, you need to speak into the mic. Is there any change, substantive change in that policy? I believe that reflects the new law. I'm sorry. Can you speak into your microphone? I'm I sorry. Hear you. Thank you. I'm sorry. It is summer, isn't it? I think this is, yeah. Anyway, the, um, the uh, policy on electronic attendance at board meetings, um, I was wondering, if, you know, if on that one, were there any substantive changes that we need, need to know about from that policy? Um, any changes? Um, what, I know it was updated to reflect the amendment of VA code uh, 2.23707. Um, and those changes were related to, so when we were in the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, we were, um, school boards were doing a lot of electronic participation. And so that code now reflects what the electronic participation is. And so um, I think we went from a place where no one was doing anything virtually to we started doing it virtually during the pandemic. And now it's just giving guidance to what the electronic participation can look like, because that was not there originally. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. So take a motion. You moved. I ask. I'm sorry. All in favor. Right. <laughs> Great. Any opposed? Thank you. All right. Uh, and so, Madam Chair, um, so as you know, of course, and we've heard from our um, and we've heard from our um, esteemed educators today that we have been working collaboratively towards um, a collective bargaining agreement, and therefore, since the school board and CEA are still working through the process. Um, we will need a motion, so uh, we will need a motion so that we can grant an extension to continue to work collaboratively with CEA. And as a point of reference, because the 120-day uh, window would have been next, will be next week, so uh, an extension is required. Madam Chair, I move that we extend um, the deadline for responding to collective bargaining. Second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. And for what it's worth, I don't know, uh, Ms. Taylor, in one of our meetings, you know, that we had with CEA, this, this was discussed. So this was not something that was a surprise to CEA. They knew that we would be asking for this extension. So, and we look forward to continuing our work. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Thank you so much. Um, we are now at items for discussion. All right, we will have our very own uh, Kim Powell come and talk to us about pupil transportation. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board and Dr. Gurley. Um, so have have some updates for you this evening. Um, some of the information you see will be information we discussed back in June at your last meeting, but there's also a lot of new information here as well. Uh, Leslie, do you want me to advance the slides from here? I think I can, yep, okay. 
So an overview of where we are now, but actually now in this case was June the 12th, the last time we were together. I thought it was worthwhile to put this, keep this slide in the deck so that the public who may not have you know, looked at the materials from that meeting in June would see what you were looking at when we started this process of preparing for the new school year. So to give context, at best, since the March 2020 school closures, the statewide school closures for the pandemic, since that point, the best we have been with our pupil transportation situation was uh, we got up to 16 pupil drivers. We had six cat drivers assisting. And so at our best this past spring, we had 22 routes serving all three of our tiers, elementary, middle, and high. And our wait list was cut to just south of 200 students. Uh, also for context, the absolute minimum number of drivers that we've ever been able to get by with, and this was where we were pre-COVID, was 24. And those of you who may remember those times, remember that many of our buses were packed, to say the least. So 24 is a bare, bare minimum. The best we got to this past spring was 22. And we always have had historically around 2,200 students, um, between 22 and 2,300 students who request transportation any given school year. On June 1st, or as of June 1st, I was notified that we had two pupil drivers retiring, two additional pupil, pupil drivers had resigned giving their two weeks notice so that their time with us was gonna end at the end of the school year. One of the cat drivers who had been helping was retiring, two cat drivers had expressed they would no longer drive for pupil next school year, and two additional pupil resignations were rumored and pending and they did happen. So as of the close of the 21-22 school year, we only had about 10 drivers back in June that we could identify as being available for pupil. Coincidentally, that is the exact same number where we were back in September of 2020 when we were trying to figure out how to get everybody back to school in person. It was a, it was a tough day when, when we got that news. Okay, so looking, looking ahead to where we are now. Actually, Leslie, maybe I'm not driving. I'm pushing the buttons, but it's not going anywhere. There we go. So where we are today, and this was August 1st, but I checked today, Thursday's actually a day we have a bunch of transportation meetings. This, these are still our numbers. We have six pupil drivers. We have four in the onboarding slash training process with maybe one who's gonna be ready to go before the start of school. And it is very uncertain at this time, we don't have any commitment that there would be any CAT drivers available to help. CAT also has their own staffing issues as well. So as of this moment, uh, Pupil Transportation Office is building routes based on six to eight drivers to start the school year. And capacity is being prioritized for students who require special trans who require transportation as part, of their, as part of their special education plan. And then all, our, along with that, our alternative placement students. So as we continue monitoring our own situation and learning from the CDL and CDLS shortage that continues to persist across the state and the nation, several things became apparent. One, significantly higher advertising expenditures and giving more money and benefits to drivers has not provided a sustainable solution so far. And it doesn't appear that that's gonna be the, the answer. It's part of an answer, but it's not the answer. It's not certainly not gonna be everything we need. Um, a combination of significant societal forces came together to create this situation. It's not any one thing, it's, it's complicated. Schools can't solve it alone. And it, it is taking a comprehensive community effort to change our course. And we, the city and schools, um, just have had to look at what other cities have done to address this problem, even prior to the pandemic, because people should understand this critical shortage of bus drivers, particularly in cities, it's, it was happening in some localities like in, around Philadelphia and stuff, even before the pandemic hit. So we have been, we look to, I look to other localities for ideas to move forward. These are just some examples of different models we looked at. So anyone who would care to do so on your own time at, you know, pull up the presentation, you might find some of these links interesting. Um, but here's sort of the, the assessment close to home, if you will, in Virginia. What you see here 
our listing of comparable um, metropolitan areas, cities, if you will, around the Commonwealth of Virginia and what their walk zones are. And some of these may have even changed. Um, Beth Chuck reminded me some of the, these, these localities may have even expanded walk zones. We have not bothered to look. We know they, they certainly in the context of this have not made smaller walk zones. I can say that in confidence, but this is from a while back when we did the research. And in the little box, you see what our walk zones had been in Charlottesville. So we had been at 0.3 miles for K4, 0.5 miles for Walker Buford and 0.7 miles for CHS. We in our national and statewide research haven't had not found any communities anywhere that had walk zones that small. The average walk zone that you, if you average the numbers there for Albemarle through Waynesboro, you'll find that the average walk zone for elementary schools is 0.94 miles, a little over nine tenths of a mile, and a little over one and a quarter mile for all other grades when you go beyond elementary. The work we've done through the summer to adjust our walk zones takes our elementary walk zone to three quarters of a mile um, or approximately a 20 minute walk. And we look at the middle and high school level at one and a quarter miles or up to approximately a 30 minute walk. That's the way we approach setting our walk zones. So what is the new, the impact of the new walk zones? Um, I already mentioned the times, the 20 minutes and 30 minutes. Um, it's important to keep in mind when you look at our walk zones, in some cases we did round up to get to the end of a cul-de-sac or a natural neighborhood boundary. In a few cases with CHS students, we did extend walk zones as high as 1.6 miles if a path is very walkable. And we have stayed within or very close to our projected time estimates for the walks because we feel like the, the time is as important as the distance. We've also done a lot of walking this summer and I wanna take a moment to thank not only my colleagues who've done a lot of this walking and checking, but also community members. It's been, for as hard as this has been, it's been a really great experience having so many community members partner with us in, in problem solving. And I'm just, I'm not gonna name names. That's a very dangerous thing to do because I'll leave some great people out, but it's um, just feel, we feel a lot of gratitude. So our bus eligibility is based on um, a combination of distance from the school and need. And um, I really wanna, I hope this works. I want, I want you all to see this really cool website if you haven't been looking at it. It's um, charlottesvilleschools.org forward slash transportation. I cannot give enough credit to Beth Chuck and Amanda Corman for the work they've done building this out. So when you go here, sorry. Okay. Um, as you scroll down, one of the things we're most excited, there's a ton of information on this website, but this link here and also further down here, oh, the new walking maps, new and improved walking maps are really nice. Again, Beth Chuck and her team, great work there in a very short order. Um, but there, that link up top or down here, there's a section, a whole section about it. It says, I've heard that the city's making many improvements and you can hit this link and it takes you to the, the, the tables embedded here. And by school, you can see all these pedestrian improvements that are underway. You can see if they're completed, planned or scheduled. You can see our crossing guard status. And I have another slide devoted just to crossing guards. So I'll go, go over that in a minute. Sorry, probably messed up picking this up. Anyway, <laughs> all right. so. This is a really neat thing to look at. And um, Brennan Duncan, Sam Sanders, the city team, just really appreciate the work. Um, this is the separate page that shows the same table, but it gives you a feel of the scale of what's been happening. We've been moving fast with um, our city partners. So, okay, Leslie, now I've got to get back to the presentation. Can you get me there? <laughs> okay, thanks. So the community can use that web page to stay up to date on all that. Um, okay, whoops, something happened. There we go. So crossing guards, um, just to give some context, last year we covered nine intersect crossing locations. Our current plan, we're, we're expanding out to 19, 17 are stationary and two are corridors that we're looking at. We've been talking about something called a walking school bus as we look at some of the numbers coming 
out of the neighborhoods, we may do a more of like a, almost like a hall monitor thing where you have um, mostly school staff in addition to the crossing guard stationed at different locations. So you have line of sight to line of sight because Friendship Court, for example, could have over a hundred kids walking on any given day. They had a walking school bus all last year that started at over 30 kids. But, and we don't know yet, um, the front office staff there, Aisha Anderson does a great job reaching out to the families, finding out what their plans are. But when you think of that high volume of students, it's just like the overcrowding we had on the physical buses from Friendship Court to Clark. We're gonna have that kind of volume with the walking. And so we're thinking instead of trying to organize them in walking groups, if we start at the clubhouse and have them walking kind of from adult line of sight up to the next adult, they'll form family groups and friend groups. That might be a better way to go. Dr. Gurley in his wisdom suggested, we're gonna test out whatever we do and have another event there, but just to such a large number of kids. The other place we're gonna have a similar situation is Hardy Drive over to Venable with our younger students and a large number. We will have a crossing guard at 10th and Page, but again, how, whether we walk with them in groups or whether we do like this line of sight, okay, walk from this person to the next person on the next block and they'll be, the adults will be able to see them. We just, this is new, but we're gonna figure it out. Um, so back to where we are with crossing guards, our current assigned is 10 out of the 19, which leaves us nine open, but we have three interviews this week. I know we did one of those three today. Um, we have three additional individuals who are interested, but haven't put the application in. So we're following up with that outreach. And then we have six people who are interested in doing it as long as they have a pairing, like they want to be paired with someone. And that's great. So that could cover effectively three more spots. So that's at least nine more solid leads we have to fill that the last nine spots that we need to have open plus our school staff. And so we have some, some folks there. So as opposed to the bus driver equation, which I can never balance, we got a real shot, a good shot at balancing our need for crossing guards and supervision on certain routes with, with what we need. So um, Jason Lee's um, been doing a lot of work with this this week and we're um, feeling very hopeful that we'll have everything in place. So I wanted to give you that snapshot um, so this is a look at the bus situation. Now, this is the data as of July 21st. Please note, enrollments, we know were not yet completed on that day. Um, asterisk, there's some asterisks on there somewhere, or maybe there aren't. That actually must be another column that's not on. But anyway, there was the need for wheelchair accommodations reduces the capacity of buses. You have to keep that in mind. And then, um, we were assuming right now, we were hoping to have nine to 11 buses per tier, but I don't know that we're exactly at that point right now. Um, but what you see here are the total enrollment numbers, the enrollment within the school boundary, meaning it's not like elementary kids who are asking to go out of zone. If you go out of zone, you're typically not, you're not eligible for bus transportation and so forth. You can see our old walk zone count was 347. Our new walk zone count is 1,138. It's over 790 kids-ish. I mean, th these walk zones are making a big difference in spreading our available resources to serve the city. Um, you can see eligible riders and then you see our bus requests. And if you total up that bus request, it's right around that. This was our bus request last year. It was right around that 2,100, 2,200 total students. Oops, sorry. Do you mind if I ask a question at this, just at this slide? So can you speak specific, may, maybe you were going to at the Clark numbers as far as eligible riders and the requests. So Clark is a very small school zone. The requests don't have any regard with, for whether they're eligible or not. That was just what was requested. Um, and I didn't, thank you for pointing that out. This was just some data that Amy Herndon in the transportation office had been working up because she was trying to figure out what how things would look when we balance out the numbers. But um, as of the Clark zone, when you look at it on the like a map from Versatrans and where the dots are within the boundary, because Clark is already such a small school zone, there are very few students who are eligible for bus service for Clark. And that's just the nature of how the Clark school zone itself is the smallest in the city. Right. I guess my concern potentially would be that those who re who have requested it, like is somebody reaching out to them to find out if they're extenuating circumstances or, I mean, that's just a big discrepancy yeah. when, you know, compared to the rest of the, right. the schools. So 
two, two points, two things I can speak specifically to Clark and in general. So on Tuesday, um, it was a little later than we'd hoped because of the glitch with school messenger, but we sent out the customized messages to every family that said your student, and if you had three students, you got three messages because you could have students that one would be in the walk zone and another going to a different school is eligible for bus service. So the, the letters said your student, the name is in the walk zone for your school or your student, the name is eligible for bus service. And so they were customized in that way. And then there was a bunch of information about where to get more information. And if you had questions and in that, there was um, you know, a suggestion to reply to walk zones at charlottesvilleschools.org and we would get feedback from that and we would be able to address those. I can tell you that of the thousands of messages that went out as of this afternoon, we had 21 that came back and we're doing individual responses for each of those. That doesn't count, I don't have a way to track the calls that are going into the schools and that type of thing, but we did like FAQ and guidance documents so that the front offices would know how to handle each call that comes in. And sometimes it's something that needs to come back to me so I can work with transportation and see, is there an issue with this? Was it an error? Because there are gonna be mistakes, but I have to say, we've been shocked that even the couple that were questioning the zones, when we looked at it, they just didn't know that there was a cut through or they didn't understand that, you know, what their walk route was. Um, but that's not to say we won't encounter issues. Um, Clark, Aisha Anderson, who I mentioned earlier, she's doing personal outreach with all of her families to find out what their plan is. And I don't think she's alone in that. But anytime you see a discrepancy like that, that's the type of thing we would look for the school office to do is just reach it out to the families and say, hey, do you have your have your plan? Because I, I give our schools and our educators, our community, a lot of credit that they know our students, they know our families, um, our L team, phenomenal. And a, a lot of, several of the messages that came back were from our L community, but they actually had more questions about registration and re-registration than they did about whether they were in the walk zone or eligible for the bus. Those things they weren't disputing, but they would be like, thank you for reaching out. I'm having this issue with power school. Or I'm having this issue with re-registration. So we got a lot of that type of feedback. Um, just a, along that line, um, do, do you, are you feeling like the you know, the immigrant families and the ELL families are understanding this situation? So um, I had several messages, again, of the 20 some, I don't know if it was quite as many as half, but a lot of them came back and it was clear English wasn't their first language. Some of them came back to me in Spanish. So, I mean, we we're definitely reaching those populations and it wasn't just um, the, our Latino community. So I definitely see just from this brief, you know, what happened just in the past few days that it went out and we're definitely getting a lot of our folks who speak English is not their first language. They're reaching out to us and and we're able to give them support. But also again, I know that our L team and those teachers and our coordinator, they there's a lot of outreach that happens there. And I will um, also add that our outreach uh, activity to the Friendship Court com yes. uh, community was our highest attended um, outreach activity. And that was a very high representation of our ELS community. And what we quickly realized is that the language was a barrier. Um, for example, I think I realized in that moment, calling, calling it a walking school bus is confusing when you go to translate that. I mean, because if we're saying there's no school bus, but then we're translating saying there will be a walking school bus, that's very confusing. And so that was one of the initial things that we recognized, but our, we had um, a great um, turnout and participation from our ELS families. And I think we heard the most concerns from them. And I think we have to acknowledge and be, be very appreciative of the concerns because I think that's how we get better. And so we will be differentiating our support um, and so we know we are going to push forward with our walking school buses, but we're also going to make sure that parents have the resources. And that's in this conversation, too, about the boots, the umbrellas, the things of that nature. So, yes, we have had engagement activities with our ELS families. Yeah, it probably would have been helpful if we, the term just recently came up, this idea of a coverage corridor where you have just higher level of coverage all along a route, but maybe not walking with the students when you have such large groups. 
So again, focusing on ideas to move forward, um, we wanna remind everyone about Charlottesville Community Bikes as a resource for bikes and helmets. If, if uh, families choose that they believe the best way for their child to get to and from school is with the bike. Um, I wanna give a shout out to our Safe Routes to School partnership, Kyle Rodlin with the city. He's been a great partner throughout the pandemic and even before then and working in our schools. Um, the thing I really wanna highlight on this this is where the term walking school bus came from, by the way, though, it's a safe routes to school term. Um, and then they also talk about bike trains, which again is the idea of an adult leading a group of students who are cycling to and from school. And Clark had a little bit of that going on too uh, in the pandemic. But I think the, the key point from this slide is, is something that I encountered in a, as we were looking at different models across the country and just researching all of this. This statistic came out in multiple places. Um, in the last 40 years, we have seen students who walk and bike to school decline from almost 50% in around 1970 down to 13% in 2009. And I took this exact quote from Fairfax County Public Schools, but that same statistic is prevalent in a lot of different places when you start to research this. And, and you hear it from adults when they talk, well, when I, you know, the old, that people joke about walking uphill both ways in the snow when, you know, when they were young, but there has been a shift. And I think in that change, we have lost some things with physical activity and, and health, and especially when you're battling screen time concerns for kids. And so I just take a moment to realize there, there can be a lot of good that comes from this, although that certainly wasn't what drove the, the change. I, I think looking for what good can come of it is, is an important thing to do. So I've already, I think I've already dropped, did the mic drop, ta-da thing around infrastructure improvements, but this is a slide that was back in your June deck. And I want everyone to know we took this seriously, the city's taken it seriously, and we're, the, the work is being done. There's much left to do, but the, um, the conversations and the, the work and the partnership has definitely got a good head of steam, and we're very hopeful it would continue. And I, there's another link to the stuff I just showed you. Um, okay, still talking about ideas to move forward, public transportation, catching the cat for our families with younger students, but also uh, for if a family chooses for their middle years or their high school students, they could catch the cat, just the student, and consider that a safe route to school. And so um, on our website, the, the transportation page, there's a section devoted to cat, and I'd like to thank Matthew Gillikin. He took the initiative to kind of really research a route for his one of their his students who's going to Walker from where they live and did put together a really great format. And now we're trying to emulate that for some other routes for some other areas to make a ready reference for families to help them understand how CAT can be a resource for their family um, to get to and from school. So we're really excited about that. And again, when we think about thing, good things that can come from this, hopefully um, the CAT system can continue to improve and expand and serve all of the community in, in new and better ways as a result of this change. So wrapping up, <laughs> um, our keys moving forward, expanding to more typical walk zones or family responsibility zones, whatever you wanna call them, that, that's, that's critical to try to balance out our supply and demand situation. Improve pedestrian and biking infrastructure, also key. Improve cat service, and I'll say improving cat information so people understand the cat system better. Um, there is a, a, an app and a link in the documentation that tell you how to like know where the cat bus is and, and getting our students familiar with that helps prepare them to become public transit users for the future. And I have not forgotten, <laughs> the multi-passenger non-CDL vehicles. Um, I have continued to do research on that. Crystal, um, Crystal Riddleval at the city with sustainability and also um, Harold Young, who's over Fleet, had some great conversations with them. Um, I've expanded the conversation and research with the Highlands to look not just at the type A options, but also vans, which may be a more affordable solution. Um, and we'll certainly continue to talk about that. One thing that became clear when we talked in June I was kind of still in full on panic mode from the, uh, <laughs> so I was just throwing everything out there and see what would stick to try to make things better. And you guys were all supportive saying, just make it the best you can go and do. Um, 
I did not know in that moment that changing our walk zones would get around, make a difference of around 800 students. That calmed me down a little bit. We still need to pursue these smaller vehicles and we still will be coming to you with proposals and ideas. And one of the most important things we can do now is look at how our wait lists settle out school by school as we you know, get our routes set for the new school year. We see who's, make, you know, who's making it to school, how they're making it to school, what is the wait list situation at each school, and where would smaller vehicles potentially make the biggest difference doing sprint runs or out and back. So we can make, make the best decision, whether it's gas or whether it's electric, where we would, where we would deploy such resources. Um, we did move forward with the purchase of two gas type A buses because we are going to need them for athletics. The CDL crisis is also impacting our sports situation. And one of the easiest things we can do is get the smaller vehicles that some of our coaches can drive. And you can't, at this point, taking an electric vehicle, running it all day, and then counting on it to go to Louise and stuff, we, we were not ready for that. So um, we, knew, we knew we needed some gas buses, so we've ordered two. And so um, I'll let people decide if they want to read the quotes or not. But again, back in September 2020, we were here kind of trying to hang on to what we had, saying this is the least imperfect solution set for moving forward. That was kind of where we were. And as we discussed in June, now it's the discussion is really how do we move forward as a community committed to a new solution set that's sustainable. And so thank you for your support in this really important effort. Kim, I have a question. Um, I, have you heard from Mrs. Uh, Ms. Johnson? I know several. I'm sorry. Mrs. George, George Johnson. I spoke with her at, um, at West Haven in the community center about the path from Friendship Court to, like, we, we, we ha I had a discussion with her there about, like, the optimal route from Friendship Court over to Buford, that type of thing, but. No, this nothing. is something else she called me in reference to. Um, okay. We do know that eventually those students uh, in South First Street. I got that. You got that already? We got that covered. Yes. Okay. All right. The those, those at South First Street are just going to be temporarily at Hardy Drive. About two elementary to three students. years. Right. Two to three years, but they still will need to go to Jackson Via. Yeah, okay. we need to do that to maintain our um, schools. Yeah, lots of things. So okay. that's been addressed. And I already have the list from CHRA, so we know who those students are. We have a shared list. Thank, thank right. you for asking. Any other questions? Dr. Kraft? Um, I wondered if we have gotten any feedback from the drivers who um, indicated that they don't want to return, um, even the ones that are retiring. Uh, and, you know, just to understand if, if it had something to do with the actual work of driving the pupils rather than other factors. So um, unfortunately, one of the disadvantages as a, of us not having the transportation um, under us like, like a typical school division is we were not really able to, um, to get at that information in a um, systematic way. So I really, I, I don't you know. have a good lens on that, I'm afraid. Okay, and just one other question. Um, sure. Uh, this is my mom hat thinking, but I'm thinking about like raincoats and umbrellas yes. and thank you. Yeah, I should you... have made a slide. <laughs> We've been working with um, Denise Johnson and, um, and Bianca as well in the family with the family engagement team and equity team, identifying what are the supplies we need to help ensure that students have what they need to get to and from school in a walking situation. And so um, we have just ordered um, like these cute little like galoshes and a bunch of sizes that go over your shoes, the rain ponchos, the umbrellas. I hope we got the clear ones. I told Julie that's the ones I wanted that you can see through, you know, as you're walking. Um, we've ordered flashlights, different supplies, just to make sure. Um, and we have through their hard work that store set up so that like not only could crossing guards or, you know, people who co cover the corridors or whatever you want to call the, our folks that are out, those folks or teachers can recognize needs and put in orders to help make sure that our students have the things they need um, to stay warm and dry uh, when they're walking. And fun fact, Jason Lee and I were at Clark having a meeting about the walking, walking school bus and all of that. Um, 
and it poured down rain while we were sitting there. And I, I eventually just bolted for the car because I needed to get back to the office. But it was one of those days, I'm like, a day like this, we, need, we would need to delay the release of walkers. And you look at those days when the radar hits and it turns red or yellow. So, you know, whereas when we were providing more bus service and your kids are just sprinting to the bus, like I had to sprint to the car. Um, and that's one of the questions we get a lot, like, what are you gonna do? So we have to realize that this will color our decisions moving forward about weather. Um, and the whole community needs to understand that. Um, you know, lots of questions have been received about snow on sidewalks and what happens when the community is not responsible for clearing their sidewalks. And, you know, um, we're having those discussions, we're mindful of that, and we're going to have to really keep a, a close eye on these things as we, as we move forward. Um, it's it's going to be different. Um, the the community is going to notice this change. They're going to see a lot more kids out walking um, or potentially biking, scootering, whatever. And just finally, thank you um, for everything that you've done to, you know, get this in place, to get something in place that's workable. I know it's been a huge lift and a, a lot huge, of work for Huge you. team effort, truly. Yeah. It's, Nothing it's of really any consequence happens, happens without a lot of people involved. And it, it, our office, the Annex, City Hall, it's a team effort, the community members, so it's been, that has been as, as hard as it is, it's been rewarding to work with people who are all pulling together, just trying to make it happen and do the best we can. Thank you. Sure. Ms. McKeever. So I was just wondering if the city is going to give us back any money <laughs> for the transportation contract. I, my opinion, um, I think the short answer is I don't think they will. There'll be, all, there'll be a lot of discussion about how special needs transportation, and it is, is costing a lot more and you know, for what we're saving here, there's going to be discussion about that these other things are costing more. But I do think as we move forward with budget, there's going to just need to be a more significant discussion around transportation. Can we get like an itemized statement from the city so, to reflect? I mean, we that, that transportation contract goes up every single year. Yeah. Obviously, I, I feel very comfortable with our walk zones. I mean, I'm not trying to, I understand the challenge as a parent, it's got a child walking. Um, but this we pay for these services that are not being provided. In fact, we're asking our students and families to go on to the city buses. So how, where's so the saving, like how, there's, how's this working? When we've requested it, we have received some line item information like that you could see how much the advertising budget went up and things like that. But the information we receive with regard, it shows what's budgeted for like payroll and so forth. And what I think we need to do is look more about what's budgeted, what's actual. And we just, there needs to be a deeper, a deeper dive and just a discussion about what's the most cost effective way to move forward. And I would put the emphasis actually on effective at this point, because we, we you know, we have to find effective solutions. And then we certainly want to be as efficient as we can be. But I think that there's need there. I anticipate there'll be significant focus on the questions you're asking and looking at the performance this year and assessing where it makes sense to put put the investments and and what what just makes sense overall moving forward i i mean one other thing that i would really i uh, i noted the path that um the friendship court children are going to be taking and how you all had walked it and realized oh that's not a good way so we're going to do this way and i just think that's brilliant i'm so grateful i wonder if we could also kind of engage with the community on those streets, just to say, hi, you know, maybe a flyer or something that indicates there will be students between these hours on your street walking, and we need you to be on the lookout, like be a state, you know, we used to have those stars when I was a child, obviously I'm very old, um, maybe not the stars, but there was something that was like, this is a safe house. And of course, whatever, I just want all the community's eyes to be on our children as they are walking to school. Every day we hear nightmare stories in our community about how our drivers are just not friendly to our pedestrians and bikers. And now we're gonna have children, uh, you know, many, many more children on the streets. And I just want to ensure that our community recognizes that A and B um, protects us. This is just something that we as a community has to have to uphold and, and, and embrace that we protect our children and our pedestrians and our bikers. It's just the way it has to be. We cannot, we've, too many children are at risk and we need to really protect them as a community. And um, 
So I hope that we will, I mean, first, I think we should engage with the community members that are on the paths that we expect our children to be walking. Um, but also I hope that our community in general um, will support the division in this effort. I do not think it's a big ask to ask our students to walk seven tenths of a mile or a mile um, and a quarter. I think it's gonna be great for the health of our community. Um, so, but we, we can't, <laughs> can't get them hurt from cars. So um, we just praying about that will only get us so far. We have to protect our students who are walking to school. Um, biking, they also bike, they will violate the road rules. Like there are things that um, children are gonna be doing. We just have to have a lot more grace in our space around pedestrians and bikers, um, but especially for our children. <laughs> So I just want to give a little lecture on that because I, we just have seen it far too often. Um, and with more students walking, I'm just really afraid. Um, and that's what I want to say. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No, thank you so much for your work. Um, as you have mentioned, there have been a lot of great, uh, there has been a lot of great work um, and ideas um, from community members. So a big shout out to all of them as well. Um, and then just a reminder that, that these things are phased, that the work that the city is planning to do is phased. So they're trying to get out and do certain things right away. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it's not a magic wand where everything can be done immediately. But, you know, I encourage everybody, if you see something, um, that doesn't feel right, you've lived in this community, you've seen things happen, to please reach out to us, reach out to the city, share those things. Um, you know, if, if family members know there are routes that are unsafe, or if you have concerns, uh, of course, please, you know, elevate them to us. Um, but then also turn to your principal and, and to the school um, because there might be some thoughts or, you know, or some ideas that are, that are going on there um, as far as PTOs. And as Ms. McKeever said, it, it's going to take all of us to really, to, you know, to keep everybody safe. So, but thank you, everybody who's, who's contributed to this. And before we move forward, before we move forward with that, I, I do want to thank um, I do want to thank Miss Powell, um, you know Miss Powell, Miss Chuck, uh, Miss Corman, Mr. Lee, Miss Green, um, and the city. I mean, because this has been a heavy lift. Um, we didn't just wake up one day and say we want to do walking zones. We, I mean, we literally closed the school doors and then we we commenced doing this work. And it, and I agree it's going to take the entire community um, and it's one of those things where you if you see something say something um, I don't want people sitting on their hands this is one of those opportunities where we have to keep our students safe um, and I think that what I've charged our team with we're going to be more visible than ever um, especially as we um, roll this out I mean we got to make sure that our students understand our families understand and we, we're going to meet them exactly where they are and so we we all may be crossing guards at some point if that's what it takes um, because the bare minimum will not be acceptable so all righty um, next up, we have our professional learning uh, opportunities, and this will be by our newly inducted Jessica Ford coming to us from Atlanta, Georgia. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Gurley, good evening. I am Jessica Ford, and I'm happy to join Charlottesville City Schools as the new professional learning coordinator. Next slide. Tonight, I would like to give an update on professional learning, which will focus on professional learning goals, professional learning framework, and theory of practice. I will outline the structure of division and site-based professional learning and go through some professional learning highlights and next steps. Next slide. So I'm gonna start with the professional learning goals. Next slide. So the overall focus of professional learning is ensuring that Professional learning provides ongoing opportunities that are intentional, meaningful, 
sustained and aligned to participants' practice and has a direct impact on student outcomes. Learning should be connected to the teacher's practice and allow collaboration and reflection. The words highlighted in blue are what we are focusing specifically on this year. Ensuring that professional learning is intentional and meaningful is imperative for staff to understand the relevance of their learning and its applicability. Making sure that it is sustainable by putting structures in place that are systematic and cohesive. Professional learning should be aligned and connected to the work of our staff and the goals of the division. Next slide. So the first goal is to provide cohesive professional learning opportunities opportunities that are connected, relevant, and applicable to teachers' practice. Secondly, we want to increase teachers' capacity to be culturally responsive um, in prioritizing the needs of every, every child. Next, we want to engage in deeper learning, educators to engage in deeper learning. And lastly, we want to focus on building cohesive and efficient systems between departments. Next slide. So I will now go into the framework and theory of practice. So with those goals as the focus, it leads to the framework that is used to inform decisions around professional learning. So our goal is to increase student achievement by building teacher capacity. What we are going to do is what is located in the yellow. Um, so to increase teacher content knowledge, according to Lee Shulman's model, teachers need to understand subject matter deeply and flexibly um, to help students relate one idea to another and address misconceptions. Having strong content knowledge allows teachers to see how ideas connect across fields into everyday life. It encompasses the structure of knowledge, the theories, principles, and concepts of a particular discipline. How we are gonna do that is what is located in red, which is developing teacher pedagogy. So teacher pedagogy is the relationship between the culture and the techniques of learning. So in the main aim of pedagogy is to build on previous learning um, of the students and work on the development of skills and attitudes of the learners. It is an educator's understanding of how students learn. So by increasing content knowledge and developing pedagogy, you will create what I call PCK or pedagogical content knowledge, where it's an integration of how teachers relate their pedagogy or how they teach or how students learn to their content knowledge, what they know about the subject matter to create learning environments where every student can be successful. The why of why we do this is what's outlined in blue, which is the data, uh, the data component. Every decision that we make should be informed by data. The context, which is highlighted in green, focuses on being culturally responsive and tending to the whole child, where we focus on building connections, confidence, and wellness of every student. And lastly, you see the cycle of learning on the outer circle, which these, uh, displays the sequential process for learning. This learning cycle, which is to learn, implement and receive feedback, reflect and then improve is important as it directly impacts uh, classroom instruction and student learning. It is a vehicle for teacher collaboration and sharing and the process improves the alignment of curriculum, instruction and assessment um, to state standards. Next slide. This then leads us to our understand, with our understanding of goal and pro uh, pro of professional learning, this leads to the theory of practice which outlines that if professional learning does not strategically design and interconnect professional learning opportunities across schools, then teachers will not have universally well-designed and well-structured content-specific collaborative professional learning that increases their capacity. And then our students will not have equitable outcomes. Next slide. I will now move forward with discussing division and site-based PL. Next slide. In the best interest and safety of all faculty and staff, the Better Together Conference will be pivoted to a virtual platform using either can uh, Canvas or Zoom. We don't think this will be a heavy lift because our staff has have been trained on these platforms uh, the last two years. So the professional learning committee consisted of individuals from human, race, human resources, nutrition. Um, we had admin techs, family engagement, uh, coordinators, and central, central office staff that worked tirelessly to put together a conference style professional learning day with over 100 sessions, community vendors and prize giveaways. Although this conference will not happen on August 18th as scheduled in person, uh, the vast majority of the sessions will continue virtually. And we look forward to planning another PL day in the future when it's safest to reconvene. Next slide. 
We have five scheduled division-based uh, professional learning days. As I just shared, August 18th is assigned as a full division professional learning day on Zoom or Canvas. August 19th will be largely school-based with some division-led PL regarding safety. The structure of the remaining three professional learning days will remain the same with a good balance of central office, PL, and site-based PL, as well as equity foundational training for all staff members as we focus on our goal of increasing teachers' capacity to be culturally responsive. Three hours will be de dedicated to central uh, office professional learning, where staff members will rotate through three focus areas that are aligned to the strategic plan of academic excellence, safe and supportive school, and organizational support. Site-based professional learning will occur in PLCs and faculty meetings. It will be aligned to the school's professional learning plan and focus on building continuity of practice across grade levels in schools, and they will use data to inform their professional learning communities. Next slide. I will now go over some professional learning highlights. So as I mentioned before, we have our PL conference um, happening virtually. We have new teacher orientation, which will take place on August 10th through the 12th, where new teachers will obtain the tools, knowledge, and strategies needed to be successful in Charlottesville City Schools. The Leadership Advance, which is led by Dr. Gurley, is professional learning for all division leaders, grounded on the work of Pat, uh, Patrick Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team. There is calibration happening across schools as I have begun meeting with principals to discuss their professional learning goals for their respective schools. And lastly, we have a pipeline to certification for instructional assistance through JMU and PVCC. There are six IAs who have expressed interest and I plan to work with them to complete their application this fall to begin uh, coursework in the spring. More information will be forthcoming. Next slide. I'm now gonna go over some upcoming next steps. So some upcoming next steps are to streamline and begin the professional learning series for mentors and new teachers. Continue meeting with school leadership to outline site-based professional learning needs. Continue planning the use of ESSER funds to enhance professional learning opportunities. We are excited about the opportunities that this grant provides us. We are currently mapping out specifics. Key elements of this grant award involve professional learning that would take place beyond contract hours, culminating in summer learning academies. This fall will largely be used to plan and refine these experiences with full implementation slated for summer 2023 and 24. And lastly, prepare for the September division-wide professional learning day. This concludes my presentation. At this time, I welcome any questions or comments. Thank you so much for that. Any questions, anybody? I just had a quick question on the uh, professional learning series for mentors and new teachers, the mentoring program. How how was that going to be constructed? So Dr. Odie has sent out a mentor recommendation form to principals. We are currently working with um, HR to see how many step zero and step one teachers there are. Once we get that final number, we will pair the mentors with the mentees. Those mentors will be trained through a series of um, training just to support on how to support, effectively support new teachers. Um, I just feel like that was a brilliant slide with the keys and stuff. So really excellent work. It really helped me to understand and visualize. And I don't know if that makes a difference, um, but I um, welcome you. And thank you for coming to our little town. And I look forward to the brilliant work ahead. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions? Sorry. <laughs> Just checking. I was doing one more scan. No? All right. Thank you so much. All right. We will now have uh, student rights and responsibilities, formerly known as the Code of Conduct, presented by Dr. Odie. All right, Madam Chair, members of the board and Dr. Gurley, good evening. And tonight, as Dr. Gurley just referenced, I would like to give you an update on changes to the student rights and responsibilities, again, formerly known as the Student Code of Conduct. Um, here you see our sum and substance uh, shown. We're gonna talk about understanding behavior, 
enhancements, um, which include a name change, uh, the S bar codes, the leveled responses, uh, and and we also have um, cell phone pieces that we want to talk about, committee recognitions, and next steps. Next slide, please. So I'll start with this piece of information that I found on the VDOE website regarding understanding behavior. Behavior is communication. So we need to understand the message. Behavior has cultural context. So we need to know the story. Behavior is developmental. So we need to assess social emotional development. Behavior is learned, so we need to teach. Our goal is to make sure we understand behavior so that we can appropriately and adequately address behaviors when they occur. Next slide, please. So we have some enhancements uh, to the former student code of conduct. Our first enhancement is the name change to the CCS Student Rights and Responsibilities. And you'll hear me call it SRNR sometimes as an abbreviation or acronym. We have seen a trend um, of among school divisions moving to names such as this, as it has more of an asset-based tone rather than a deficit-based mindset. Uh, we are hoping to create a positive and preventative approach to student conduct, starting with something as simple as a name change. In previous codes of conduct, we have talked greatly about responsibilities, but we wanted to include rights as well. When you think of student rights, we acknowledge that students do have rights such as faith, free and appropriate public education a right to a safe and orderly learning environment, and a right to be respected and treated fairly, amongst other things. And students have responsibilities that we have outlined here in the SRNR document, such as attending school regularly, knowing expectations and conducting themselves accordingly, treating others fairly and as they would want to be treated and more. We have even included the rights and responsibilities of parents and staff members in this document. But for tonight's purposes, we will focus on enhancements regarding students. The SRNR explains expectations for student behavior and adult responses thus S-B-A-R, S-Bar, to enhance school safety and to create a fair, equitable, and supportive school environment. And it is more responsive to the changing needs of our students. We know that, that children are different than they were when we were children many years ago. Behaviors are different, needs are different, so we need to have differing understandings of the why of behavior and the responses to the different behaviors as, as well as consistency in response to behaviors. Next slide, please. And another enhancement is the use of S-bar codes with fidelity. We must teach the behaviors we want to see in a school setting, in our school settings. These ideas lie at the foundation of the 2021 model guidance for positive preventative code of student conduct policy and alternatives to suspension, long name, but that is from the Virginia Department of Education. And it's directly connected to the Virginia tiered system of supports. So you've heard us talk about VTSS previously and positive behavioral interventions and supports. You've heard of us talk about PBIS. The student behavior and adult response SBAR behavior descriptors in the model guidance have replaced discipline, crime, and violence 
DCV is the acronym for that. Th those are the codes that we have all grown so accustomed to using. And research was noticed in that model guidance, and it stated that African-American students and students with disabilities were disproportionately represented in referrals to juvenile justice in Virginia schools. Students with disabilities and African-American students were being suspended at two times the rate of non-disabled white students. And we see this happening here in CCS as well. Behavior descriptors from the model guidance, which describes student behavior without bias and criminalization, encourage administrators to ask what harm was caused and what caused the behavior. What is the student communicating? They refocus administrative responses to behavior to being prescriptive in regard to the student's social emotional development. And they give the student the opportunity to understand the behavior's impact on the community and to repair the harm caused. The goal is to shift the mindset from criminal language to developmental approaches. This is why these behavior categories were created by the VDOE. Our staff were trained last fall re regarding SBAR codes by Patrick Farrell, and we phased out the DCV codes in the fall and moved towards using the SBAR codes. This year will be our first full year of fully implementing these codes. Next slide, please. On these next two slides, I have included the new SBAR codes for your viewing. Behaviors that impede the academic progress of the student or other students, BAP or BAP. Behaviors related to school operations that interfere with the daily operation of school procedures, BSO. Behaviors of safety concern, that create unsafe conditions for students, staff, and or visitors to the school, BSC. Next slide, please. Behaviors that endanger self or others. These behaviors endanger the health, safety, or welfare of either the student or others in the school community, BESO. And behaviors that are per persistently dangerous, PD, or you might see that as BPD. Next slide, please. Yet another enhancement to the S, R, and R involves the leveled responses to these behaviors. This is brand new for us this year. What we noticed previously was that there was inconsistency in how schools responded to similar behaviors. We've created levels of response, one, two, three, four, five, and determine the level of response for each behavior. We are again aiming for consistency with regard to discipline and want to minimize disproportionality. Next slide, please. I've prepared a couple of examples as shown on the next two slides. For this scenario, David uh, repeatedly interrupts the teacher while she or he is talking. David does not raise his hand and is talking loudly during an independent practice. So uh, this would be a level run one response with a teacher looking at the S, R, and R. They see, okay, this type of behavior, I would use B, I would, it's a level one response, meaning that it is a behavior that's impeding the academic progress of that student and or other students. And so it's a classroom-based response. The teacher handles that. It's not one that would go to the principal, not one that would, um, teachers would be on the walkie-talkie calling for assistance. The teacher handles it. There's intervention. There's management um, there. Next slide, please. In this scenario, we have Missy. 
And Missy has been caught, unfortunately, cheating on a test in class. So using the SRNR, the teacher looks to see what level of response does this require. And so it is a level two response that would work well for this behavior. Behaviors relating to school operations that interfere with the daily operation of school procedures. So some options for um, the adult response for a class, it could be a classroom-based response. The teacher could handle that. The teacher could call home. The teacher could work with the student. It could also be an administrative intervention that is required here. So there are some options. Um, there could be in-school suspension up to three days. Those are the level two response options that are listed in the SR and R. So you'll notice that teachers and administrators do have these options regarding the response to behaviors, but we wanted to make the options clear so that there is no second guessing as to what is an acceptable or appropriate response to certain behaviors. Next slide, please. So here you see enhancements that we have made to cell phone expectations. We've had continued concern from staff regarding student cell phone usage during class time. And what we have seen is that overuse and misuse of technology such as cell phones can result in problems such as negative academic outcomes, chronic distraction during instructional times, including phones ringing and students receiving alerts. This does happen in the middle of math class, unfortunately. So you probably know that in previous years, we have had guidance in regarding cell phones and other personal devices in the former code of conduct. We've had guidance there. This year, however, we are being more specific and enforcing that cell phones and other personal devices should be off and away unless otherwise directed by the teacher of that class. So we, we may, you know, just sort of coin that term off and away, they need to be off and away not a distraction. Next slide, please. Dr. Odie, can I ask a question um, for a few slides back, if it's I'm, okay? I'm sorry, say it again. Can I ask questions about a few slides back or do you want me to wait till the end? Oh, you can ask now, sure, certainly. Which slide is it? When you were talking about the different tier two level responses and there were different ones, is there someone like, will you all still monitor because there's still a little wiggle room with the punishments, you know, and how they're doled out. So do you all still, are you, do you like see it in real time and send it back or say, no, this, you know, it might not be balanced in this case or something like that? I try to stay in communication with principals and administrators about different behaviors. When there's something minor, sorry, my glasses are fogging up. When there's something minor, like a level one or level two behavior, I may not hear about those. Um, we do give those options. If we continue to hear about or see that this student keeps getting, you know, this, they're just demonstrating this level two behavior and they keep getting up to three days of suspension, we'll hear it. <laughs> and so we will we'll work with the principal and and look at why. And remember, we're, we're, you know, we're teaching the kids the behaviors that we want them to display. Uh, we also, our, again, I said our staff was trained on S barcodes. Um, the leveled responses are new this year. So I want to be able to talk with them about utilizing those and being equitable and how, you know, we've got it, we can look at the data. The data tell the story about the disproportionality. I was just having a conversation earlier today as we were preparing for the Better Together conference and all of that and looking at data. And it tells the story and we cannot continue to have, you know, students disproportionately suspended and placed in 
uh, ISB and ISS and all of those. So we'll we'll continue to work with staff on um, using the appropriate response, adult response to specific behaviors. And we don't other, want it to be anything to be overused. And the other part of that is it is the range. So what we would not expect to see. So for example, uh, in the case of the student who's cheating on a test, um, there is a range. So we would not be, we would not see a student suspended out of school. But we would also not expect to see that if a student had cheated on a test and it's the first offense, that the student is getting three days of in-school suspension. Mm -hmm. Because while we know that that's the range, there's also a classroom-based response that could happen initially. And that classroom-based response would, I know, our teachers do this anyway. They want to know why the student is cheating. Like, you know, I hear teachers say all the time, you have so much potential. I know you know this information. Why did you cheat? So I would not expect that the student would get, you know, a in-school suspension. But if there's something that continues to be blatant um, and something that's um, intentional and, and under continually to undermine the process, um, the educational experience, then I think that's when we may see something more. But of course, one thing that we don't see here is we're going to be engaging families um, mm -hmm. because we want to get to the why. Mm -hmm. um, and so this doesn't tell the whole story, but we will be doing, teachers have been trained. Um, there was some brief training on the SBAR, but what's brand new that they have not received is the response levels because that's the new component of it. So we will have to do that work, and which Dr. Odi already mentioned. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Um, I think we are on the slide with so. Yes, that one. Uh, so here we have consequences to the overuse of cell phones and other personal devices. Uh, there you've got first warning, um, first offense, verbal warning, second, student conference, third, parent guardian contact, classroom referral, fourth, parent guardian contact, office referral. Like we're not sending, our, our teachers love our kids. They care about our students. and and we don't anticipate that teachers will send kids to the office the first time any of these things happen. We want, like Dr. Gurley just said, a range um, of, of what they can do. And this really outlines steps, okay? You got your warning here. You know, you've got that phone again. This is the next time. This, so teachers will have to keep data um, of, you know, how often they're having to ask a student to put their phone off and away. Um, and if they continue to do it. And, and of course, if the unauthorized cell phone usage during class continues, additional administrative responses could occur, such as a student success meeting. Like what is going, again, we're trying to figure out the why. What is going, I think we all love our cell phones. I know I do, but there's a time and a place for it. And so we have to figure out the why. Um, so that could be occurring during student success meetings, a referral to uh, VTSS, counselor support. And if it just continues, um, then we may need to look in, into tech overuse support groups for students. Uh, there were other changes to our SRNR to the point where it is now, but I wanted to highlight these areas specifically tonight. Uh, for your information. Uh, next slide, please. And we did have a thoughtful and committed committee working with me on our new document. And I just want to take a moment to recognize them and to thank them for their hard work. You see their names there. We had teachers coming in. It was, school was over. <laughs> it was after June 16th. We had two teachers on our staff. We had one of three, three teachers, I think, on our staff there, um, administrators, central office folks. So I am so grateful for the work that this team did to, to help to develop this new, um, very important document that we have to support our students. Um, it is absolutely appreciated. Next slide, please. As far as next steps, uh, we're going to move forward with sharing this new SR&R document with students and families. 
we will continue with implement, implementation of the SBAR codes with regard to discipline and monitored disproportionality. Uh, we're gonna support schools with consistency of implementation and consistency in the response to the behaviors. Don't want one um, school do, responding to the same behavior that's displayed at another school in a different way. We wanna be consistent. And so that concludes my, uh, if we can go to the next slide, I believe we have the sum and substance. Yes, uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, at this time, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Ms. Dooley. Uh, thank you for this work and to the committee. Um, I would like to see um, coming back to us um, some review at certain points, maybe it's at the semester marks of this data broken down by subgroups so that we can see uh, the progress towards uh, not disproportionately disciplining um, students that have been targeted in the past. Um, so if there's a way that we can work to create a report that we can sure. see that, that would be great. Um, the cell phone piece uh, is critical. Um, you know, I hope we have reminders to teachers also about appropriate use of phones during uh, times when they are student facing. Um, and then I'm also just curious about how we're bringing parents on board. I know that there are um, parents who feel strongly that their students should have phones and they should be in constant contact. And I think a lot of the, you know, dinging of texts and things are often parents <laughs> communicating with their kids You're right. during the school day. <laughs> um, so just, you know, how are we approaching that conversation to um, you know, start the year off so that this can be successful. You know, I worry about the amount of time teachers are going to lose. You know, we could get through those four offenses with a cell phone in, you know, the first 10 minutes of a class period. Um, and so just, you know, how much time are teachers going to be spend, you know, spending on cell phones and then as an extension, administrative time just on cell phones um, mm -hmm. is a little bit of a concern. So just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that support piece um, is huge. And then again, just bringing parents on board. Yeah, thank you um, for, for mentioning all of that. We don't anticipate that it'll be easy. Um, like I said, we many people love their cell phones. Our students do as well. And you're right that oftentimes it's mom calling or texting the student in class. Not always, but every once in a while, I do hear that that did, does occur. So we think that communication is gonna be really key. If you notice, Beth Chuck was on that um, committee and so she's been working closely with me. I anticipate that we'll, we'll send lots of communications out um, that we're really gonna be enforcing. Like I said, we've had guidance and expectations before. It's the enforcement that was not necessarily taking place and we really want to move towards enforcement and we have to explain to parents the why. And, you know, um, I shared a couple of, um, reasons that overuse of, of cell phones is bad. There's a whole list of them in our sr and &R. And so we want our parents to read that and see what it is we're trying to accomplish. Yes, we want our children to focus. We want them to be attentive. We want them to learn. Uh, and there, there are things that are inhibiting that for some of our students. So it won't be easy, but we're ready to we're ready to move forward and and get our parents on board. And, and yes, you mentioned the teachers as well. We got to work with our teachers, and I think that they'll be on board too. So next, um, well, I I would like to um, echo the uh, what Miss Dooley said about coming back. I was thinking that um, it would be really helpful for us to hear like, you know, halfway through the year or whatever, um, how this is working, um, things that need to be tweaked, et cetera, that, that kind of thing. And, you know, I really uh, appreciate the effort to be consistent all the way through the process of dealing with kids' behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for that. And, um, my one other thing would be just to, you know, as you're communicating to students and to parents, um, I know, uh, you know, education um, is just so full of acronyms, and this is so full of acronyms that sometimes it's, you can get lost. I have found myself getting lost in the acronyms, and it would be really 
uh, important, I think, to not rely on those when you're trying to explain this to families. The Students acronyms like BAP and BSC and BSO, <laughs> those are not necessarily for parents. That is really yeah. for reporting. Okay. So yeah, we're going to be very clear about what it is that the student did. And then um, in, in, I think in the SRNR, Student Rights and Responsibility, <laughs> I know. Uh, they would have a list of certain behaviors and where it, would, where it could possibly fall. Yeah, but so, just, you know, putting it in language in sort of everyday mm -hmm. street language. I Absolutely. <laughs> I agree. Thank I you. agree. <laughs> Thank you for this presentation. Thank you so for much. For your thoroughness. I appreciate it. Mr. Morse? Could you come back to me, please? Absolutely. Mr. Brandt. Um, Dr. O.S., I want to first uh, all thank you all for the great job in your committee. But I'm going to go back to my, in my I'm going to kick into my teacher mode. And when I read this last night, this um, enhancement on cell phones, because it, 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 it has been brought to my attention, community members and teachers, that how much cell phones is a big distraction in the classroom, especially for a lot of our learners. And when I looked at when I looked at this, I said, "Lord, this is a lot of steps." So, Miss um, Dooley, I've already given her verbal warning, and Dr. Kraft, I've already she's on her second offense. And so, you know, teachers are spending a lot of time juggling first, second, third offense. And I guess somewhere in this policy, and I know I've been reading a lot being on VSBA board, a lot of schools are doing not doing away with cell phones but just sort of narrowing the use of the cell phones before school, on the bus, before school, during lunch, and uh, maybe between classes if they have time. But they're a little bit more specific. And some of them are just doing away with them altogether. But it seems like with all these steps, it's putting a lot of onus on the teachers because it looks like if, if one student's on step one, step two, there seems to be, uh, for me, as a teacher, it would be a lot of steps mm -hmm. in terms of the use of cell phones. So is there something in this policy that, that indicates that, and I know parents are concerned about being in touch with their children, but is there somewhere in this policy that we could say before on the bus, before school, during lunch, after school to be more specific, as opposed to just you know having to go through all these steps? We talked about more stringent um, procedures. And this is- It's not, I don't consider it stringent. I just think it's more specific. Yeah. And it's not overwhelming the teachers. I think that um, what, I, what I heard from committee members was that if we, you know, we, we know that there's some school divisions that are, have completely gone away for the day and things like that. Um, but I think that there was there's a bit of a hesitance to sort of rip that band off band-aid off like that and say they're absolutely not allowed. Some actually do use them for educational purposes uh, in class. And so this was a sort of a way to address them without because if what I understood was that if we say there's none at all during the day, that's going to be a bigger battle than having the giving the warning. Yeah, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying specific times of the day, mm -hmm. on the bus, before class, at lunch. They still have use of their cell phones specific times of the day. And I, I, and I think if I can jump in there, um, not being on the, I wasn't on the committee, but I think from some of the initial recommendations, so um, I know that I had, um, a lot of conversations, for example, um, with Dr. I when he was here, um, because there was a, a working committee, um, Ms. Horns uh, shaking her head, there was a working committee that really put um, a document together that I thought, um, you know, wow, if we take this on at this moment, I, th I think it kind of speaks to a lot of what you're saying in terms of um, there's these colors and these, these times of the day, um, but I think what happened, um, you know, when you assemble a, a, a thought group um, and such a diverse thought group that 
you know, this is where we arrive. And I think that the staff really felt that this was a good starting point um, because we had some, there were a lot of conversations about transitional time and, um, you know, what happens during lunch. And I think we can, I think we can um, begin to, um, I, I, when I was a teacher, you know, September through, September through, um, through um, January, I was always Joe Clark. I was really just very firm. And as we start to learn one another, then I can start to relax things. And I think what we can do is just communicate to our students when you can when you can use the phones but i think initially we have to build the relationships and i think that this is the professional development piece and and our teachers are good with this so this is not going to be too hard we we build the relationships and we start to remove a little bit of that power struggle um, so that students understand that you're going to be provided the opportunity but right now until you get this math problem it's um, off and away. Um, and then we build up to the moments where, okay, when you're transitioning, I mean, and I think what we heard is that there's a lot of concern, even when students transition in the hallway, that they're getting text messages from friends and that's what's inciting them to not want to go to class and then go out and find this other student and, and you know, do inappropriate behavior or, or um, do defiant behavior. So it was, it's the task, this is a heavy lift. Um, and, and I think your points are absolutely correct, but I think this is reflective of the, these, this document is, is a reflection of the practitioners, meaning the teachers um, and where they want to start. And I think we can, I've seen some of the other options and I think we can get there. Um, but I, I, this is definitely going to be a, a heavy lift and we will need to communicate with families and it's going to feel different. And, you know, and I know that this is not too big of an issue with elementary. I hope I'm not, I'm not even a thought. I see teachers back there nod. This isn't too big of an issue with elementary. And I know if Dr. Um, uh, Hastings was here, he would say it's not too big of an issue at Walker. Um, but then as they do, you know, as the freedom and changing the classes, and, and I know that we will work with Mr. Jordan and a B for team, we will work with our new principal um, at, at the high school, and we will, we will make sure that we can meet our students, but it's going to be a mindset shift. And Dr. Gurley, I will add that in, in the document, it does say that students can use their personal devices on the bus. Um, it does, it says that specifically under elementary and Walker, but under Buford and CHS, it says that they are turned off in designated instructional spaces. So uh, we didn't use the words that they could have them in the cafeteria in the hallway, we really hope they don't just because specifically what Dr. Gurley said, and we know that in unstructured times, that is often when behaviors spike and escalate. But we did uh, give a little bit of leeway there that it's during instructional spaces that they're off and away. And also in doing so, I think, um, I know because community members come up and they ask about well, what's going on with the cell phones especially at the high school level. And um, I think community members also need to be in tune in terms of this as well. And also teachers are concerned about, um, about the cell phone use, not being able to instruct because of the distraction with the cell phones. Mm -hmm. yeah. That and has I, been the, the concerns that have been at least mm -hmm. brought to my attention. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I hear you also that it can take time uh, to have to continue to talk to David or Johnny or Susie or Missy or whatever about the cell phone. And that that was also brought up in our committee meeting. And, and so like with, we know it's not gonna be easy. Um, and I think oftentimes because of the time and effort, that's why it's often not enforced. We do want it to be enforced so that we can have students really focused on their learning and hopefully students will get to the point where, okay, um, Ms. Jones is gonna, uh, she doesn't mind if I use it when I'm in the hallway, 
is when I'm in this classroom that I've got to stop using it. Uh, so we're going to get to that point with building relationships. With, and I think that that is a huge piece, um, building relationships and setting those expectations with students and families. Okay. Ms. Bryce Morseberger? No? Ms. McKeever? So um, thank you again. This is interesting um, step. I understand it's because of the state, the VOD, the standards there. My, um, I, every time you say the word enforcement, I get a little trick, you know, twin, I just, it's, it's a worrisome word to me because it's so disproportionate in our community against our um, black, and, black and brown children. And so every time you say that word, I just, I just see bias and I see disproportionality. So I hear you um, and I just have to have it be said because um, enforcement is not the goal. <laughs> the goal is to not have the behavior. Um, and I, I, I feel very strongly that every child that comes into our division needs to have an IEP. And um, this, any child who's getting regular enforcement needs to have an IEP. So I just don't know how you, you know, how um, we have, you know, we have many schools, we have four schools that our students are going to, and I, I can look at their records on a discipline, but I don't see where, what we have done to support them necessarily in these interventions. And, in you know, we've enforced a lot, but what are we doing to make it so that we are, are, are individualizing to them um, their education? That's just, I just feel very, like, I understand that our teachers love our students and are, um, you know, are going to go through this process and do, everybody's going to check all the boxes, but what does that mean in the end? And I think Emily's um, point about a report is great, but I actually think we should dig even deeper than that. And, um, and, and really understand where our students are coming from and why they are encountering these problems at school so regular. It's just not an enforcement problem. This is a community problem. Um, I know, for example, at lunch, uh, using your cell phone is, is literally a fortress, right? You can, you are sitting in your lunch, you don't have to engage with anybody, you are on your phone. And like those protective, behaviors are, are just so vital for a high schooler who's trying to maintain a control of their lives. So I just worry so deeply that we're going to find, again, a person. I'm not suggesting this is a culture. I'm just saying like somebody will be like, oh, you shouldn't be on your phone and oh, you should do that, you know, and be telling a student who is, you know, having a hard day that they should not be on their phone. Obviously in instruction time, we expect you to be learning and focusing. Any other time, I'm, why are you in that child's business? Um, I, I, enforcement is a very tricky word for me and I just get very uh, anxious when we use that word because of the way it's disproportionately doled out. And I just feel like just because we can doesn't mean we should. And what are we doing better to, to make that child's educational experience better? So. Um, and, and that go, leads me to this dress code because like we talked a lot about cell phones, but the dress code, obviously I've been here long enough <laughs> as most of you have, I mean, we have fought this dress code battle on at least three different times I've been on the board and, you know, I, I really don't want to see a student be sent home because her bra strap is showing or anything, you know, like I, I just looked at the dress code and, um, I just am curious what the ideas were when the board was looking at, or when your committee was looking at the dress code. Um, and again, I just think it's too, um, I, I think there's a lot to be desired and there's too much power given to a grown up in the situation where for somebody to abuse their power rather than find a way forward with the student. Ms. McKeever, if I may, um, the dress code piece was devised by 
staff members a few years ago. We didn't, we didn't make changes. We actually pulled it from the old document and plopped it right in here uh, so that it is it represented what was decided by Charlottesville City Schools employees um, a few years ago. I guess I just heard last year was a little bit tricky in some schools in terms of the hoodie and in terms of some you know, allegedly provocative wear, especially early last year. So I just want to make sure we're being consistent about the enforcement of that as, you know, at least the principals are well aware of what that dress code means. Mm -hmm. And and also, if I may, um, I hear you about the word enforce. Uh, I, it was never my intent to, to um, have the connotation that it does that it obviously had uh, with you when particularly the the change in this document from code of Con student conduct to student rights and responsibilities was to remove the criminalization and the negativity and make it more of a positive and supportive document. There will be behaviors. We know that. And there will be adult responses that need to occur because of the behaviors. We know that. And there might be some more serious behaviors that require different levels of responses. Um, I think that the difference in what the beginning of my presentation and the, the, the last part regarding cell phones uh, is that the cell phone piece is where we had it and we just did not really um, require the students to put them away. So I, I hear you absolutely. We want to understand the why behind behaviors. We wanna support students and families and, and teach appropriate behavior so that students, all students can learn. The students that are displaying the behaviors and the students that are, are near the students um, who may have their learning interrupted. So we, we do have work to do. Absolutely, and and I believe we we had a, a a wonderful dedicated committee that's that put some great ideas into this, and now it's time to share it with the rest of the staff, uh, to teach our staff how to utilize, um, how to really change the way that we address behaviors, and support students, um, and help our students to understand those expectations as well. But it really all starts with building relationships with students. Yeah, I agree. I think um, just so you know, my child yelled at me one time because I texted him in the middle of the day. Oh, cool. so um, I <laughs> do. Right. I, obviously, I was just thinking that his phone was on silent and put away, and um, he was like, "I I, I, did, I forgot to turn it off." Anyway, um, I just want to say that uh, it might be a really interesting and good educational community engagement to say to parents like, "Hey, you tell your children to have your, you know," because I mean, I text them just not expecting a, an answer, um, but for him to know what's going on with the day. And I think it might be useful for um, parents to understand, to not expect a response because they will be in, in class learning. Thank you. Mr. Morse. Um, I have a couple points. Um, one was mentioned, I think once or twice in terms of responses, responses. Um, specifically kind of the level one, level two. I know certainly our teachers are doing that um, consistently um, and those are kind of part of their practices to some degree already. I do worry a little bit about um, putting, at least to me, it feels like a little bit more onus on the teachers in terms of those responses. Um, but, you know, as I'm hearing, it sounds like there's some buy-in from teachers, especially the ones that were on the committee uh, to develop this. But that is uh, just for me, I feel like is a, a point that I should raise as well. Secondly, um, I thinking about this document, thinking about the name of the document, student, students' rights. And I'm kind of curious, and I'll take responsibility for this as well, because this was mentioned in our last June meeting that this might come up. At what point did our students actually get a voice in this? Um, and I feel like if we're gonna really take the approach that students have rights, 
students have um, this, we are calling on their responsibility. At what point do we ask them for their feedback? Now, everything cannot be decided with students. I certainly understand that, but I feel like in such an important document that really focuses on how they behave in our schools um, to be able to get some feedback from them. I know that at times that we have a student represent, representative on the school board. Um, I feel like this is the point where we really want to hear from them in developing some of this. Um, again, I am a person that really believes in student voice and making sure that they're heard, um, especially as they're getting older and as a person that has tried to develop a cell phone policy with high school students, I know it can be difficult. Um, but I don't want to focus just on the cell phone piece. I, I think just overall for some of this, I, I think it would have been important to have some of their response and feedback. And maybe we did have some of their feedback and I'm not aware of it. And so all of the, I can assure you that 100% of the, so the hot button, the big ticket things were all addressed with students. So um, I won't say that they were, uh, they were done with elementary students, but uh, Denise Johnson helped me to organize the superintendent's advisory for um, our secondary students. And so each one of these things were talked about. I think the students, um, and I will say the high school group, um, were consistent of some of our honor students. And we had students who said, I celebrate on the days that I get a D because I know I've done my best. And those students were reflected in that group as well. So I think we got a, um, a great cross section of students, not just always the students who um, are, are doing well, but they're just doing their best. Um, and so we got feedback about, you know, school lunches. We got feedback about uh, with regards to the dress code and and that I will tell you that that was um, you hear me say big lift a, a lot because that was a big topic because you know I think my views are probably um, a little 1960s sometimes when it comes to um, dress um, but what we heard um, what we heard was that we need our um, our dress code to be um, not targeting, um, particularly, and I heard our females that I felt like some of the previous uh, language only targeted our female students when it came to dress and we needed some more gender neutral language. Um, and so that's why you heard Dr. Uh, you heard Dr. Odie say, the work was already done here in Charlottesville. And so that came over. Um, I think students took a harder approach uh, with cell phones than we did um, uh, on our advisory committee, particularly at the high school. Now, our Buford students, uh, I, they entertained me with the, with the cell phone conversation, but our high school students, um, they felt really, they felt stronger than, I mean, they said, you know, my teacher spends a lot of time correcting behavior or it's it's very distracting. And so I do from the teacher lens of it, and we had teachers on the panel, I mean, in the group, from the teacher's lens of it, it does feel like we're placing it, like we're placing um, the onus back on teachers. But I think what we are saying now is we're making it really clear what's a teacher managed behavior and what's a um, school administrator managed behavior. And we're not saying that um, sometimes we know that we need the assistance of the administrator, even though we've listed this as a teacher led. And if there's someone, because if there happened to be one, not that there's always one, but if there, we, if there happens to be one, a teacher who's an outlier, who's preferring to use the administrator versus the teacher, then we can support the teacher and say, hey, is there some help we need to provide to this classroom? But I do believe that we captured, now I wouldn't say we captured elementary's voice um, in terms of students, but, um, I do believe that when we put this document together, we were able to say, but the students are not going to like this because we've heard what they said. And we're going to continue to do um, the stu superintendent's advisory group um, this school year. So we're going to continue that. Thank you for the explanation and additional information. Um, just for me, just because this is kind of who I am, like sometimes when we go through those policies, it's nice to hear that you know, just a reminder that this they go in, in front of students. Um, and I will dismiss the last thing I have to say. Thank you.
You're good. I'm good for now. Okay. Um, our next item, we do have our um, transgender policy um, by Denise Johnson and Beth Chuck. Good evening, Madam Chair, School Board, and Dr. Gurley. Thanks so much for having us this, this evening. As always, I wanna take a moment to thank you for your ongoing support and affirmation of our equity work. This evening, we want to present to you a quick overview of our policy, which supports our, our students who identify as transgender and non-binary. This policy is another component of our division's commitment to equity and aligns with our strategic plan. As a division, we want to be intentional in our efforts to replace the factors that may lead to inequities and instead adopt attitudes and behaviors that reflect acceptance, belonging, compassion, integrity, understanding, fairness, cooperation, and respect. Additionally, building and maintaining strong systems that ensure that our students feel connected, support, supported, and safe is essential to achieve in our equity goals. As we present this, uh, stand, this draft standalone policy in support of our students who are gender expansive, I'll give a little history of how we got here. It's my understanding that Charlottesville City Schools was among the first in the state to uh, broaden its non-discrimination policy and in, in to include gender identity and expression. And so while we are always learning and we are always striving to do better, we should realize that in some ways or in many ways, this commitment and this work is not new to our schools. In 2020, the state passed a law requiring the VDOE to develop guidance for schools in support of students who are tra transgender and non-binary. After the adoption of this state model policy in 2021, you may recall that the VSBA recommended a comprehensive approach to um, uh, adopting or, or uh, trans uh, changing policy. So in the spirit of that, instead of developing a uh, standalone policy, at that time we followed the VSBA's recommendation and we did a review of our various policies and practices. And this strategy, I think the single biggest kind of takeaway that would be um, visible or recognizable to families was uh, last fall when Denise and I spoke to you about how we were changing, how we handled students' chosen names in power school and things like that. So those are the sort of, um, I don't even know that there were a lot of changes even during that year. I think a lot of these practices were already in place. Again, always being tweaked, always being revised, but were already in place even then. But that was a key uh, change that came from that review. However, at this point, we are recommending a draft, uh, this draft standalone policy for your consideration. The goal of this policy is not to create new protocols or new practices. That's the work that has happened over the last years and, and probably even longer than years. The work of this policy right here is to bring all these ideas together into one policy for the sake of clarity, uniformity, and continuity. So here are our next steps. We are requesting that you all review and approve the policy when you're ready. Once approved, we will begin division and school-based training on policy and regulations. Over the course of the school year, we will continue our training and workshops on supporting our LGBTQ plus students with our first session scheduled for August 18th during our professional learning conference. Lastly, as we put systems into place that support our students, we also wanna make sure that we're supporting our staff as well. Therefore, we will continue conversations that will ensure we're being intentional about being fully inclusive. As you review the policy and regulations, please let us know if you have additional thoughts or feedback. And thank you again for your time. Thank you. Um, any questions from anybody? Ms. McKeever, we'll start at your end. So thank you so much for all of the work that y'all have been doing on this. Um, my question is, uh, can we, well, to what extent do we need to wait? Because they said they're waiting for our approval before they start training on this policy and regulations. And I just wonder with the start of school, it might be useful to have the policy move forward. Um, but obviously I'll take the will of the board. I just wanted to know if delaying 
So really, I mean, we had all of the pieces, correct? They were just spread out. That's correct. So if I may, just was curious, like, um, besides pulling all the pieces together in one, one um, policy, I mean, what other type of input or have you had any other feedback or reached out to other groups to weigh in on that? I think some of this feedback has come truly over the years as we've made these changes. But Denise and I did put a little list together. You know, there have been um, student groups over the years that have been vocal about some of these issues. Uh, there have, uh, we've, we've leaned heavily into our school mental health professionals to speak to these, especially very specific practices. Um, we've checked with members of the LGBTQ community for a whole variety of reasons over the years and leading up to this policy, including this year. Uh, we've spoken with principals, equity committee members, uh, so just some general community members who have expressed interest on this. So there has been some feedback, um, both over the months that we've been sort of reviewing this, but also again, over kind of the years that we've been putting some of these practices into place. Yeah, so and our school board attorney. So I mean, to what extent um, would this impact or hold up training because we we have all of this even you know if we were not to to approve this tonight mm -hmm. we're prepared to move forward with our lgbt plus uh training as is so we have a training plan in place but to have training specifically on the policy and the regulations regulations associated with the policy is what the approval would would move forward so i mean i read through both but i mean does that feel really differently i mean is that going to impact the training i mean are people going to go oh my gosh this is so different this feels different no but we do want the staff to be informed and our students informed the community informed of the new policy and what what's involved with it and so it's a it's an information um session that will be had about the the overview of the policy and the regulations associated with it okay any other questions from so we'll i just have no doubt that this is going to eventually pass unanimously and so I feel like I would love to keep with our the policy of or practice of not moving something to an action item when it hasn't been advertised as such mm -hmm. but I would think that at the August 18th training session you could okay. assume that it is coming and can anybody think of any other groups I mean I would like for us and I think we would continue to be open to getting feedback from local groups or other groups. I know a couple of us were emailed, um, you know, and had had eyes on this policy and eyes on Charlottesville. So I just, I, and not that this board wouldn't continue to do better if, if there were changes that we needed to, to offer to the policy. So, I mean, I concur. Does anybody else have any questions as far as I, I think we should vote on it, but I, I, personally feel like my and I will of the board is to go ahead with the training is there any are there any problems with that yeah yes go ahead Dr. Kraft um yeah just um I think this is really terrific um what I I was wanting to ask about the piece where you're talking about um you know use of facilities and um if another student is uncomfortable with the transgender student, then that student can be um, shown some kind of alternative alternative space. Or is that a new thing? Is that was that added as a new thing, or have we had that we have in other policies? Okay, yeah, it's just you know in our the, the climate <laughs> out there, um, not not so much in our division, but out there. Um, you know, about, you know, um, well, you know what I mean, you know, parents' concerns and things like that. Um, um, I don't, I don't, you know, I mean, that's just going to be out there, but I think this is great. It's really important for us to have this. And I don't think anything should hold up the training that you're going to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Craft. Mr. Bryant, sure. I said a quick question. Um, the student success meeting to support 
uh, trans transgender and non-binary students, is this gonna be strictly for school counselors or other staff members? Will they be trained in, in, in doing these meetings? So we've talked, um, we've talked at length about this because um, I think this was like the, who's responsible for this and, and really, when we think about it from a team approach, it's whatever the resource that the student needs. Um, so typically the student has this great relationship with their um, school counselor. Um, if we're talking about a secondary student, sometimes, you know, at the we do experience this at the elementary school too, where the teachers lean into this. Um, but I think when we look at it more so from the developmental aspects of what um, I, some of our older students need, we really talked about who are the people and the resources that come to the table? Sometimes it's the social emotional worker. Sometimes it's the school counselor. Um, sometimes it may be the teacher leading the work. Um, I think it's who has the relationship with the student. And I think that that's kind of where we landed. We we know that we want our um, we want our school counsel school counselors to be trained in this, but sometimes the counselor may say, but they have a better relationship with Mr. Bryant, their science teacher. Um, so we need to pull him into this work. Um, and so we've not said that this is the sole responsibility of, but we know that someone may need to take the lead in order to ensure that the um, student is successful. And I, I think one of the roles of the counselor in this is just frankly, just the accountability piece. All right, the student said they want their name changed. So who's gonna follow up with that? So I think obviously, like Dr. Gurley said, we're sort of leaning into who, is, who does the student have a safe and trusted relationship with? But then there's the piece, who's gonna make sure that all this gets put into place? And so I think that's the place where you, where you just have to have a designated person so that it doesn't fall into the cracks. Any other questions, comments? So not that I expected you to be prepared for this, but I was just curious, like where are we in each of the school buildings as far as bathroom designation? You know, I know that some schools have have changed signage on them to just be, you know, non. I, I could be wrong, but I believe all the schools have gender neutral bathrooms or that just say student bathroom. And I think all the schools or almost all the schools have single stall bathrooms as well. So that that definitely is, as you know about the Buford designs, that is the the, the wave of the future is to have single stall restrooms. And so that's, um, but we're, we're just fortunate that some of our buildings had that baked into the design, even from our, even in our old buildings. So, um, so that's, that's an area where I feel pretty confident. Yeah, I would just love to hear if there aren't, if there are some that don't have that, if we could address that, please. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, any other questions, comments? All I right. just want to make sure for our follow-up. So you want to know if that, if, students don't have access to because I know Miss Swift looked at me like what am I supposed to write um, so you want to know if they don't have access to a single stall or if there's one available then we're good in every building well I would hope that we're moving towards just gender neutral bathrooms in all buildings and I want to make sure that I mean, there may be some that are designated. I don't know, but I just want to make okay. sure there is there are access okay. in each of our school buildings. Sounds great. Or, you know, bring that back and we can have a further discussion about it, I guess. <laughs> and maybe to add to that, the situation in terms of locker rooms, um, I'm not sure what that is for the school district right now, but maybe that's something we need to look into and figure out how that's being utilized. That's re, um, related to like how the policy impacts locker rooms. Okay. And we, it has language in there about the um, locker room. So we can make sure we vet that. Yes, I, I saw the links. I just want to make okay. sure that we're yep. updated to make sure yep. we're, we're yep. good. And I just, I will also just reinforce, you know, one of the things that just becomes more and more clear to me as we talk about um, bathrooms or locker rooms, students may want privacy for a whole host of reasons. Right. And this is just one example by, by training our attention on students with particular needs or particular concerns, we benefit all the students. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate Thank you. you both. Good presentation. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we have another um, policy update from Ms. Powell related to non-resident students. And then she will also follow that up with our security camera update policy. 
Yes, thank you, Dr. Gurley, Madam Chair, members of the board. The first policy that has um, three updates is the admission of non-resident students policy, um, JECC. The three updates are fairly straightforward. One uh, needed to update the titles for who has overall, overall responsibility or oversight for the program from assistant superintendent to chief operations officer. That was just a decision that was made when Dr. Odie came on board, she was CAO and there was a title change. Um, so that update is reflected here. Also, there was an update to reflect the, um, our actual practice of allowing payment plans for families before I ever came into this position under special circumstances, payment plans were allowed up to December. And this was prior to the pandemic, but families have been allowed to do that uh, if there were special circumstances. And now um, since the pandemic, they actually, again, in special circumstances have been extended to full year at times. And in conjunction with that, we are preparing to um, hopefully allow for a credit card payment option. We don't have the solution in place yet. We've explored some options and some other priorities have put it on the back burner. But while we were addressing tidying up this policy, we wanted language that allowed for that. So that those are the changes for the um, policy JECC. Any and, questions? Oh, okay. sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna see if there's anybody question, any questions specific to this. All right, thank you. All right, do you have the next one as well? So the next item is the um, is a new policy. We don't have a policy explicitly for security cameras and video recordings, although a number of our policies would make reference to them. We didn't have an explicit policy. And so this policy um, addresses why we have cameras, how video may be used, where and how cameras um, operate in our facilities, who is authorized to access video, um, the record retention requirements for video recordings, which are in alignment with the Library of Virginia. And essentially the reason we're bringing this forward is we're, we found that with the expansion and improvements of this element of our security system, um, certain situations come up and so forth where we just felt that policy was silent where and we wanted to, to be more um, transparent and readily available as, as far as what the camera system is all about, what role it plays in our security system and, and how we, we work with that system. So uh, this policy is brought forward for your consideration. Any questions, anybody? So, I mean, I did read through this as well, um, but I'm just making sure that this is hallway or they're not in classrooms. No, no, not at all. We're not going uh, there. The camera placement is primarily our, our goals. Um, we're through the in, con continued investment. We're still trying to realize all of this, but we'd like facial recognition quality at every entry point into the building in case we need that. Um, there is hall coverage and we like to cover, if we're gonna cover a hallway and we have to make choices, you always like to, um, in our current situation, know when students you know, be able to identify entrance and exit to the restroom, but you can of course never have cameras in restrooms or in classrooms. And then um, when the other area is sometimes like in large common areas like gyms or cafeterias, just general high level cameras that cover a broad area. Exterior perimeter cameras, it's nice to have coverage on parking lots and frequently traveled areas. Um, so there's certain criteria we consider about where cameras could be most needed and most useful. It's also important to understand we don't have staffing to monitor cameras. <laughs> cameras are used, um, to identify what happened after something has happened primarily, or, and this is considered best practice, if an incident is occurring, if there's a crisis with an active threat, you can we can partner with law enforcement for them to gain access to the camera system in the situation, and that can help people understand what's going on in the building. Um, and that's part of the infrastructure and plans we're working on with our um, first responder partners. Any other questions? I just wondered, uh, do we have enough cameras um, to satisfy our security needs? So the high school, we've made great gains and improvements here as well as at the middle school. And of course, as we design the new middle school, we'll have a good lens to that. Um, the elementary schools are lacking in cameras. Only Clark initially had cameras, but with our latest round of security grant um, applications, we're looking to um, add cameras at our uh, elementary schools. We've had a number of requests from principals. It's primarily uh, property damage, after hours, things that happen, exterior coverage. 
is really what we're lacking at our elementary schools and we're looking to um, make gains in that area. It's still good to have facial recognition on who's coming in and out of your buildings, but beyond that, you don't have the same level of hallway coverage and things like that in an elementary school. It's perimeter and entry points primarily. Those are the goals. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Powell. And um, our last agenda item is Dr. Baptist and she will be bringing uh, the COVID update. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Gurley. Well, we're going into the, another school year and we're still dealing with COVID. Um, you have a document that has um, come from the schools. I know principals were involved and I don't know who else was involved with coming up with some of the questions. And Teachers. then central, pardon? These are teacher questions. Teacher questions, okay. <laughs> and then um, administrators at central office have reviewed some of the questions and we've also done some research for different things to come up with some answers. And as we get started with that, I would like to say our answers to some of these questions are current as of August the 4th because things are still changing. I was um, to be involved in a meeting this afternoon with VDH updates and it was canceled because they're expecting updates from CDC any moment. So there, I will have another meeting. So what, what the recommendations we have now are right now. So we will see what happens. Um, rather than going through each of these one by one, unless that's the way you prefer, I did want to just list a couple things that we are continuing, that we have been doing um, up to this point. We will be continuing testing. Uh, we will have the company who's been doing the testing will still be coming three days a week for this next year and we'll have that schedule out soon. We still will be doing a dashboard. Uh, we will be encouraging vaccinations. If, if uh, Blue Ridge would like to do any vaccination clinics within the school system, we'll certainly support that, but we will still encourage. We are going to continue with COVID leave. It was mentioned this evening by one of the speakers that it had five days in, in our listing. That has been changed to seven days. And one reason for that is with the change that we're doing with only isolating for five days, you're likely to have a weekend in there. So it could be more like seven to nine days that somebody would be out. So the seven days is what we would have for COVID leave, which would not affect someone's sick leave. It would be converted to sick leave. And Dr. Baptist, I think also just to, um, you know, because I know that question came up um, earlier, with regards to, you know, we we recognize that as we looked at the data from last school year that households were impacted. Um, and so um, it does list, um, Dr. Baptist does have listed here that we're gonna work with people. Um, with most certainly, we don't wanna cause any hardships. Uh, we don't wanna cause any hardships with uh, any of our employees. Uh, and I think the, the key to what she just said was that, you know, this, while we're giving seven days, it really turns into nine days because um, just organically a weekend is gonna fall in there. So it's um, it's nine days right now, but as we assess each situation and so just working with your supervisor. So if you're a teacher working with the principal or you work, if you're whomever else working with your supervisor, but this is just the start and it is ever evolving um, based on the needs of our employees. And, and one reason for this too, is that with our change in expectations for quarantining, um, which are lessened and for isolating, which have been lessened from 10 days to five days, it's not as likely that people will need to be out as long for any instances. So as Dr. Gurley said, this is something that we will continue to work on. Um, we will still be doing some contact tracing. The health department has given us some guidance that rather than doing contact tracing for every case, we will do it when we have three connected cases, which could be three in one day or classroom or one each day over three days that are connected. So we still will be doing some contact tracing. Um, filters, we will be updating our filters, uh, at least some of the filters in the schools uh, with an MOU that we have with the Virginia Department of Health. We are, get, are being given about $150,000 in an MOU for some coordination help regarding COVID in, in way of personnel. 
uh, and with filters. So we're very pleased we're getting about $71,000 in filters. So we are excited that the division will not have to um, handle that expense. And then of course, we are still continuing masking for staff at this point. And so those are the things that we are looking at. From last year, we do have some changes, which I somewhat alluded to uh, looking at the changes in quarantine. The, the um, advice from VDH did change in July that if someone is exposed, whether they are vaccinated or not, they're not necessarily expected to quarantine if there are no symptoms. So we're following all of this guidance. We're looking at it and we are up in the process of getting updates on the um, division website so that we'll have all of that, knowing that it's a changing process. But we know what's up there now is from 21-22. And Ms. Chuck and I have talked several times about getting it updated and we will get that done by the time school opens. So those are some of the, the main things that are going to stay the same and a couple of the changes. And again, I will be glad to go through any one of these questions um, or in all of them, if you would prefer. Anybody have questions down to my right? Ms. Dooley, Dr. Kraft, to the left. Um, well, I just, I just, have, oh, yeah. just real quick, could you just update us on the, the community um, transmission level? I can. Um, it gets updated every Thursday evening. So since we've been in this meeting, um, CDC is listing Charlottesville City back into high. We were in medium last week. We were back into high this week. And uh, Albemarle County is listed as medium. So I always check around. And I didn't, I didn't check some of the other localities, but we did move back up to high this week. You're welcome. Mr. Bryant. I just had a quick question, Dr. Baptist. Um, the new um, booster shot that's coming out in September, will that be available for Charles and City employees? Or do it we have will to make certainly our own individual be available. Plans? I don't know whether Blue Ridge will want to do a vaccination clinic within the school system or they'll just give us information about where people can go. If they're only giving us information about the clinics, we will certainly share it. If they would want to do a clinic within the schools, then we would support it. Is there a reason why we're um, not going to do the tracker anymore? Um, what, one of the recommendations changed because of contact trace. Oh, wait, what, may, I might be answering the wrong question. Are you talking about the dashboard or contact tracing? Uh, the by school tracker that used to be up where you would say how many cases there were. I thought there was a question in there well, that it wasn't going to be. We're still doing the dashboard. We just have not had many cases reported. We've only had two cases reported since July 1st. Now, do I think there are more cases within the school system? Yes. But since many people are not working this summer, we have not had the cases reported. But as soon as everybody's back in, we've already got the mechanism in place for the cases to be reported, and we will be updating them daily. Oh, okay. I thought it said we no longer will do the daily. Okay. I think I think you, maybe you okay. were talking about the schools, like the calls okay. from individual schools that changed, right? I mean, I think that's school based. Oh, we'll continue the weekly spreadsheet. We will. Yeah, we'll continue okay. the Okay. Okay. I thought it said we're not going to update it daily. Sorry, that was it. I was. We will be continuing that. And calls, we may change that to. Uh, classroom calls versus entire school, depending on cases. Okay. And you said that, um, Dr. Gurley, that if um, someone has exhausted their leave, they can still come um, to the administration or HR for some. Yes, ma'am. So um, again, we um, we've been playing with the number, um, and so what we decided upon was the seven days because that. The seven days is longer than the recommended quarantine and then recognizing that that would essentially give people nine days because there's a weekend, you know, there would be a weekend in there somewhere. So that's nine days employees have access to. And most certainly if, um, you know, if COVID is going through your home and there's some leave issues, then we just are going to encourage people to work with the super um, that I'm going to encourage the supervisor to work with the employee. Uh, as we always do. 
Can I just uh, make the suggestion? Uh, I thought what Ms. Esposito was talking about was very wise that um, if we could uh, offer, I uh, have some of the, like, I think seven days is plenty of time. Uh, honestly, I, I think I was telling somebody I have like literally five days of leave, sick leave the whole year. So, I, um, <laughs> but I do find that the, um, it would be helpful to talk with the teachers about that. I mean, to, to have, uh, I think that's a, a great starting place um, is to sit down and, and ask them what would be best. And I think you might come up with the exact same plan, but I always, and, and I know that, you know, everybody's been out of town this summer. Um, and certainly we don't wanna ask uh, more of our teachers <laughs> over the summer than we already do. So uh, I think it might be helpful though to have a, I would love to see a basically COVID committee like we had just kind of continuing to discuss these issues behind the scenes to give us these recommendations because I, I think we, there's a lot of div division um, and it would be helpful if we could kind of have a, like some unity saying, hey, this is what we decided based on X, Y, and Z. And I would just, and it would be very helpful as a, as a policymaker. Um, so thank you. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, and we most certainly can, um, you know, I'm definitely not opposed to engaging teachers to see where they are in terms of, you know, like the number of days. I, I think what we all decided as what we all concluded as a committee is that this go around is going to be much harder than previous years in terms of like tracking COVID. And, you know, we used to encourage people to go to the doctor uh, when they weren't feeling sick, when they were feeling sick, I'm sorry. And now we're doing a lot of rapids and and so I think this go around is a little harder. And so we most certainly will always work from a great place and, and you know, work on the honor system um, and don't want to penalize the masses because of a few. But I, I think um, from the, it, this, this one is, this go around is hard um, in terms of creating regulations when we um, have very little guidance. And so, uh, yeah, we can most certainly pull together a committee and, um, one of the things that I put down is um, my little chat with um, Jessica Taylor to just get some input from C. I think that's been like my easiest go-to now. Just call Miss Taylor <laughs> and see what she can help me with um, just getting the pulse. But it, this go around is a little difficult for us out of transparency. And the health department is still doing the calls with the local school divisions. Right now we're doing it every two weeks, but I'm we probably will go back to every week once schools are back in. And I do want to give us a little plug because we are, um, I think, one of the only school divisions doing COVID leave at this moment. Um, so that makes me feel really good to know that, you know, we are at a starting point of offering something where others are not. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you as always. And yeah, we understand that things are changing rapidly, probably right now while we're in this meeting. Um, you know, and, and I think what I would hope and, and I would ask is that, and it feels like, you know, again, we, we've had a couple of conversations tonight where um, the decisions and the onus and the impact of some of the decisions that we as a board are making and, and Dr. Gurley and his team are making, you know, are only impacting teachers. And, and I don't want you all to feel like that. And I'm asking that we all remember that decisions, you know, whether you're talking about masks or whether it's quarantine um, and, and the lack thereof now, that affects a lot of people and it affects big systems and it affects teachers in the classroom and whether if you're out and, and we don't have enough substitutes to start. So, I mean, I, I want, and I hope that everybody will pause um, and just, you know, uh, is this the best decision? And, and it's not just about me, you know, and I might be, um, you know, putting out half of my fellow employees if I show up or, or whatever the case. And then also with families, um, you know, you, you've, been operating um, with the, the executive order that was put out last spring with 
the opportunity to make a choice, you know, for your students to, to show up and wear masks or not. And we want to continue to support those kids who, who need or want to wear masks. Um, again, we're not, we're not speaking about it, but I want them to feel supported. But I also want families to, to pause. And, and I realize that there are burdens on families sometimes um, as far as um, not having enough days to stay home if your kids are sick or maybe the families are sick and kids are most likely exposed, but they're asymptomatic, but we're going to send them to school and there's trickle, trickle out effects for those types of things. So I just am asking that everybody really think this through and, and we are in this together and we are doing our best as a board and a division to take care of everybody. And we want people in the, in the buildings. We want students learning in the buildings. We want teachers here um, establishing and making those relationships with the kids. So it, it's really, really important. So I hope that everybody will continue to do a good job um, and, and think about others as well. But thank you, Dr. Baptist, as thank always. You. Gotta find my agenda. Thank you. All right, the next item um, was our board response to written reports. Um, and then we are moving on, if anybody had any questions about that, and then we are moving on to um, our next opportunity for comments from members of the community. So if anybody would like to come up out of the media center. I see nobody jumping up. Um, and if we have anybody online who is raising their hand or expressing a desire to speak. We see nobody, I'm seeing a nobody. Okay, so thank you. Um, for that. And next we have comments from the board. So I will start down here with Ms. Dooley, if you have any comments. Dr. Kraft. Yeah, well, I would first like to um, acknowledge that we are starting another school year. And this is Dr. Gurley's first start of the year. We're almost with us for a, a whole year, but anyway, there's a lot of exciting things. I know we're all, you know, we we get bogged down by some of the, uh, the COVID and some of the negative things, but I think there's much to be celebrated in all the work that's gone into starting the year and all the people who have um, put in the work that will help us start off and launch a new year that um, I think will be a great a great year under Dr. Gurley's leadership. Um, just to mention that, and I just wanted to say that, you know, regarding collective bargaining and, you know, the process that we've been in, yeah, you don't want to walk out yet. Um, <laughs> but but um, I just want to say that I feel very encouraged by um, the process and by the, the hard work that everybody has done. Uh, this is, it's so new and, you know, it can be very fraught in a lot of ways. And um, uh, I think that we, my feeling is that we're sort of working through that. And I really look forward to um, adopting a resolution in soon in the near future and really embarking on this process. So, um, you know, I, I think it's going to happen, and I, I feel encouraged right now. I feel good about it. So thanks to everybody who's making that happen. Um, and, I, and I guess just along those lines, um, just to reiterate the importance of having uh, for us as board members to hear from teachers, to hear from staff, um, it's really, I mean, I'll speak for myself, but when we are tasked with making certain decisions, um, you know, for me, it's very hard to know how to do that without um, knowing what the people who are, you know, teaching and working in the, in the division, what people really want and what you think is important. So 
I hope we can we can continue to have a strong voice that and and it that you will reach out to us as board members, you know, to let us know what you think. And then uh, one more one more thought I had, um, and this has to do with the media, um, and the importance. You know, I think the media, our local media, have been very important in um, communicating the work that we're trying to do here with the community, with the larger community. And um, now I think it's especially important to be able to, you know, I, I, to appreciate that, appreciate all the work that the local media has done. And also going back to all of our issues about transportation and kids getting to school, I think the media can play a really important role in um, bringing the message to the community. And as Ms. McKeever was talking about before, um, making sure that the whole community is engaged in protecting our kids and understanding you know, <laughs> the difficulties that, of what we're trying to do and getting everybody to school safely. So um, I know we've lost uh, Catherine Knott and we didn't get a chance to say goodbye to her, but I know she did a lot of that work and I know there are others out there. Um, and so um, I appreciate you and and really ask that you continue to, you know, bring the important issues uh, out to the community. Thank you. Mr. Morse. A spark. A small spark can ignite a fire and the same goes for a spark of passion. A spark of passion can ignite learning. And that learning is what propels us and lights the future for our students. For any students that might be watching, I doubt it during the summer, or any parents that come across this meeting and wondering what to say to your students, I ask you to tell your student, your child, to take the path of exploration, take the path of creation, and take the path of imagination, because you never know what spark might come out of that. And not to be too metaphorical, but as educators, we have to provide the right environment. I won't get into all the Kindle and everything to, to make a fire go, but it is certainly our responsibility. And I know we take it seriously as educators to provide the right environment for our students to foster that fire, that passion, so they can learn throughout this school year. So. Good luck and we'll be supporting you. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Well, Mr. Morris, you're a hard act to follow. Well, you're really, all right. I like that. Um, I like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. And certainly uh, I want to encourage all of my fellow, notice that fellow colleagues, because once a teacher, always a teacher, a great start of the school year. I can remember I was in August, you know, the excitement of getting ready, getting prepared for the new school year. Can't wait to see your kids decorating your, the bulletin boards and all those things that are going to prepare them for, for the children. Um, our staff members, um, bus drivers, just everybody, the whole village in terms of um, educating our children. Uh, I wish you well. Um, have a great school year. And... Um, by the time we come back together as a board, you've already been in the mix for a couple of weeks. So you would have gotten your feet wet. So I wish you all a great school year. Ms. Nope, Ms. McKeever, oh, you're good. All right, thank you everybody um, for all the comments. Those who showed up for public comment, thank you as always um, for your messages. We appreciate all of you. I did, uh, again, I just, and I'm not going to read the specifics, but I do want to remind people, I appreciate emails that we receive um, from parents and teachers. Um, and, and I think I just want to remind people that we do occasionally get emails from parents who who do have concerns, you know, about the mitigation that, that we're putting in place and keeping their kids safe. So I don't know that that those get talked about as much as some of the other things you know, is, and questions about uh, some good questions, you know, but 
families who would be interested in cohorting their children with with other kids who prefer to mask. So I just don't want us to lose sight that there that there are parents out there who have those concerns. And and I'm not to say that they don't all, but that they are voicing those, and they have some good ideas. So again just adding that and remembering that when we're making decisions because there are families who out there who are out there who who do have those concerns and have brought some of those to us so um we appreciate everybody we appreciate dr Gurley and all the work and that your team um has continued to do throughout the summer we are here to support you and we look forward to a great academic year so thank you dr Gurley. moving on to you sir all right. Um, I just want to remind everyone that um, we are back in the full swing of things. So um, our open houses and back to school events will be taking place very soon. And the uh, information is is here on your cal um, screen. And in addition to that, on um, Monday, May the 22nd, we are going to have um, an event. I think someone mentioned it earlier. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's because I said May earlier. <laughs> um, uh, on Monday, August the 22nd, we are going to have the, um, we're going to do another event over at Friendship Court, um, where we're going to do just the little walking um, exercise where we just connect with our families. And, and again, I think we, we talked about the importance of just keep doing this and doing this until we get it right. So we do have those events coming up. And just to remind, you know, we We'll continue to do our um, testing, um, our testing events in the school, and um, and you see this outlined. You see this outlined here, um, and our back to school, um, our back to school bash, which is on August the twentieth. Um, that's a Saturday. We will be having that, and I um, I just want to make sure I say that we have a lot of work has taken place this summer. Um, you know, people always say, "Are you enjoying your summer? How's your summer off?" Um, and um, I can't, there's a lot of teachers that I can say have not had a summer off because they're doing the work. Um, the, our administrators are doing the work and, and I just wanna make sure that everyone's putting their oxygen mask on first and taking care of yourselves. Um, and so that we can be well for our students when they return. We had a safety summit this, um, this summer and that was um, Kim Powell and Jason Lee led that. Um, and I just want to reassure families that as we open our doors, that their children will be safe here. Um, we've done safety audits. We've prepared our staff members with protocols and response mechanisms to keep our students safe. And so I'm just very appreciative of all the work um, that's taken place. And that is it. And I just want to thank everyone. And I'm excited about having my first official start to the school year. Yeah. Right. We'll have yeah, thank you. Um, and we have our um, first work session wrap up and we are testing you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, did I not say that? I'm so excited that you're here. It was just very um touching to see her kind of looking at Dr. Really. Did I get that right? <laughs> Um, so to come back and discuss the student rights and responsibility enhancements um, and how it's working overall and maybe share some data. And then um, to make sure all our schools have gender, gender neutral bathrooms as well as where we are with the locker rooms. Yep. Anything else? I think. Oh, and, oh yeah, just consideration of a COVID committee reconvening kind of, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, upcoming meetings. Ooh, I dropped the ball on that one. We have our, our next board meeting in September. Um, yep. And I don't have the date. September 1st. All right. So that's an easy one. Um, I want to welcome um, again, wish everybody a great, great start to the year. And um, thank you so much. And I will adjourn the meeting. That's it.